as you can see, I am in charge of this particular blue ship today. I have decided to occupy the seat, and I have had my food. So it is Fluffy Researches is up bed, blue ships. Hello, everyone. Hello. I am, of course, Raleigh, and I'm giving you the back of my head at the moment, but, you know. Hello. Ooh. So, I had to go get someone because, rather like he's sitting in my lap now, he's recently decided that whenever humans sit down, it's lap time. And this is far. This is of course fine. He, he's basically noticed the corgis getting more, getting lap time as well, and he he feels he should have more of it. Um, however, he's developed a habit which has mean he has been sending more and more time in my office. Because, basically, he also believes you should never go to the loo alone. So, he's been, he, he, he's been sent out here and is keeping me company this evening and is taking over. But he is the reason I was slightly late because I had to go get him and then I realised I got him but not got his dinner. So, apologies. But, you know, Fluffy Research Assistant is here. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? So, hello, Calvin Gosberg. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Tasha Tuvishel. Hello, Tana Verka. Hello. Ooh. What do people think about liners for troops invading France? Well, so far, I've been watching quite a lot of comments coming in going, hmm. Um, the main criteria, which I had to sort of point out to people, is it wasn't... If it, if it was a question which was, what would I do if I was the Germans in World War One? I'd have probably done the boring answer of, well, I wouldn't have invaded Belgium. I'd have sat across my defensive lines versus the French border. And I'd have gone and beaten up the uh, beaten up the Russians. And the British wouldn't have got involved in the war then. And I'd probably have used my navy to destroy the French economy. Because really, it wouldn't have taken too much effort to do that. And not touching Belgium, etc. would me and beating concentrate and beating up the Russian army would probably make the British not want to get involved because for the British, if someone else beats up the Russian army for them, that's not going to cause them to complain too much, at all. In fact, in fact, in any way, shape, or form. Not necessarily need a functioning port for a liner. This is going to sound strange, but if you had, if your liners were fitted with the right davits, etc., they could unload fairly quickly. Because all you only need to da offload the boats once. The rest of the time, you just need a pontoon system. You can get walkways down to, and you can get the people off. Then offloading the per uh, the heavy equipment, etc., and the supplies, that's going to be more effort. But the initial load of people could be done quite quickly. But yes, I'll do a proper comment response video, I think, to that one. Ooh. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, 96831. Hello. Hello, Mr. Serrani's End. Hello, Byron. Hello, Stephen Richards. Thank you, Jack Ray. That's very kind of you, gifting five memberships. Hello, Fives. Hello, Daniel McCall. Hello, Paul Beswick. Hello, Christopher. Hello, Martini Henry. Hello, Furry Kitten. Hello, DG40. So YouTube just gave a 30-minute notice of the stream. Well, it was supposed to be. I'm, I'm sure I put it to start at seven o'clock. Maybe I'm early. Um, then I'm. Well, then they're definitely good. <laughs> uh, da -da 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 -da
What was the point of the triple four inch forty five Mark Nine? It's a pointless gun. Does it be cancelled? No. It was designed to provide you with maximum firepower to take out most destroyers and torpedo boats in World War One. Let's be honest, most destroyers and torpedo boats in World War One, if you get hit by a four inch shell, you're in a lot of trouble. Get hit by a couple, you're in a lot a lot of trouble. A treble mount, therefore, therefore, uh, theoretically, gives you many chances of hitting him. The fact that it's quite complicated to load, and it's at the point at which, honestly, once you've gone down to that size gun and you're doing manual loading, you're just getting in way of each other with a triple mount. There are issues, but there are reasons for it. Orin Taylor, Raleigh is in charge? Yep. Hello, Glenn. The poodle is in command. <laughs> hello, the Royal Router, and hello to the Naval Nuclear Power Training Command. Enjoy. Hello, Bug Guy 329. Hello, Melanie 6040. Hello, Stafford. Let's see. Did it, did it. Hello, Alfred B228. Poodle, uh, well, Poodle Vengers. Hello, Mikey Newman. Hello, Amelia Burrow. Hello, Wayne. <laughs> Hello, Seneca Nero. What used to harm Slinkies? They don't have a naval war for. Any pirates of cargo ships? What else? Um, Pretty much that. And quick stuff you can put round bases. And to provide a quick defence for a ship when it's on a harbour position, which you are requiring to secure yourself. If the British poured work in the Vanguard, how quickly could she be in service? E.G. Bell North Cape? If they had poured into service, they probably could have got her in that as soon. Roughly. Probably easier to get the 14-inch King George V in service as they were further along. Alright, so in this alternative version of 1914 scenario, the Germans think ahead and not leave most of their ocean liners in New York Harbor. They didn't even leave most of the... This is one of the myths that comes up that they left most of their liners in New York Harbor. You have to remember just how many liners they actually had. They leave a large number in New York Harbor, yes, but that's not most of them. That's a, sign that's a significant number of them, but it's not most by any stretch of the imagination. It's just, the fact is they're so big and there are so many of them that people often look at numbers and go, that must be most their liners, without realising that just how many liners, the two largest, uh, two largest liner, liner by tonnage liner companies in the world, had. So you recommend that Germany invest in a concrete land, maybe? Mm. Hello, Megas Ryan. Hello, Shimmy. Plus, I'd also expect in any scenario where you've come up with a Schieffelin plan, which is based on amphibious operations, you probably put the same amount of preparations into preparing for that as you did in terms of the Schieffelin plan for land operations. I.e., you would have thought, okay, right then, it, with the la land one, you put it built railways and put all sorts of things in, in place to provide logistics and the support. You'd probably do the same for the sea operations to support things out. There are lots of things you could do. Hello. What have you got in your eye? Got it. Hello, new IQB 4472. Do I. Ah, uh, 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 it's the big flu. Yes, it is the big flu. My turn. If the CIA is. Uh, if the CIA had recovered the K129's SSN5 SLBM, would they have learned anything? Uh, that Russian systems were even more hopelessly over-engineered and badly designed than they thought they were. Um, pretty much. Uh, they'd have probably learned some interesting stats about their targeting. You have finished your dinner. And you now look at me with great glee, you're standing to attention. What do you want? Oh, you want a biscuit. Please note, yes, that I do have a canine fluffy research assistant slash producer on duty today. Don't tell your mummy. 
But now, now I've and now I can actually turn around and get books. <laughs> this could be a very different stream now. <laughs> oh, a very very different stream. By the way, my book, which is the engine's version of this, has still not arrived back with me. I have requested for it because of what the videos I am recording this week, which is why I sort of did an engines theme one, and because of I can't be 4472's um, train books as well. I thought I'd put them on the stream mm -hmm. and discuss them all. But it's a case of... and Yeah, I, I, I've been using tools today. It's one of those interesting days which involve me doing rather too much plumbing. And there's the engineering book I was looking for. So... My friend Drakinafel and I use uh, I use similar books. We both use a short history of naval and marine engineering by Edgar C. Smith. It's a good one, and I'll be talking about it in a bit. Other one I'll be talking about this one: the structural design of warships. Always a good one to get into. I have got various train books down there, which all come from IKB four four seven two, but also up here we have. That 45 destroyer. Battleship Bismarck, owner's manual. I'm not sure how I've got hold of these, actually. I think someone might have given them to me, but I'm not sure, because I don't think I bought this one for myself. Dreadnought Battleship, Haynes manual. Again. I think someone might have given them to me. If you have... Remind me. Not that one. <sighs> Not that one. This is the trouble. I've got so many books up here. Ooh. Victory. The 100 gun first rate. Thought that'd be a cool book for today. Uh, a cool one for today. And yes, my books have got slightly mucked up today because of me actually digging around for tools. That's what's mainly re reorganized my entire room. Uh, powering the world's airliners, because I just thought that'd be cool to talk about that one again. Mainly because last time I talked about it, I don't think I necessarily gave it the fairest assessment. Not that one. I think I got them all. Ah! Motorsports Military Heroes. Again, I don't think I gave this one a good, uh, good enough assessment when I last talked about it, so... Pulled that one up again. And that should be... That, I think, is it. Although, there's also... That could be a cool one to talk about in today. I will do. I'll do the Battleship Builders as well. I'll add that one in. So that's... Um, plus some Steam Train books on the floor. Three. Seven. Nine books. Let's see how many of those we can get through today. <sighs> uh, no, we do not need an HMS Did You Spill My Pint, Furry Kitten, because in the nicest way, if you spill a British gentleman's pint, or indeed, even worse, a British lady's pint, that is not... A ship which is going to take half measures. That is not a ship which is going to understand the concept of proportionate response. That is a ship which is going to go, you spilt my pint. Bye bye to your entire country. You think war spite's aggressive. Do not name a ship spilt my pint. Ugh. Also, this is going to be the last brew ships where I'm going to have a bottle of Iron Brew. Now, there's a reason for this. I am going on a bit of a fitness kick until, well, until we go away, because we're going to be Australia in June. We've got all the plans sorted in place. We've now got to do fundraising for it and sort all those arms and take in advice. And before anyone asks, yes, Castle May, I have got a rough list of where I'm hoping to see, but this is my proposed list. Not everyone else has agreed, agreed weighed in and... We are taking four of us are going, so at least. So it's going to be the same as the Canada crew, so these things might change. 
but I have the Western Australia Maritime Museum with HMAS ovens and Australia 2. I have um, Amity. I have Castle Main. I have Polly Woodside. I have Diamantina. And of course, I have the Royal Australian Naval Heritage Center. I have the Royal Australian Fleet Air Arm Museum. I have a poodle currently trying to get closer and closer to the biscuits and think I don't notice him. And uh, we, of course, have HMAS Vampire, which is, I would say, this is going to sound strange. Going to Canada, the trip for me was entirely about seeing Haida. Entirely about seeing Haida. The rest were all absolute amazing cherries. But the cake, the icing, everything was Haida. This time... Well, the cake is seeing Vampire, but the icing is going to be seeing Jamie, as in Jamie Seidel. And hopefully getting to record a bilge pumps in person with all three of us just actually sitting around for the first time, you know, ever. But anyway, I am trying to basically get a bit fitter and a bit healthier. And I had an honest conversation with a friend of mine who is a PT, physical fitness specialist, and they went... What's your sugar intake? And I went, not much, because basically all it is is iron brew. Otherwise, I don't buy sweets, and I don't really have chocolates. I sometimes have chocolates when I'm on a live with you all, but that's usually the chocolate I will eat the entire week. Because I try to be good. But when I'm hungry and I'm talking, it's on a live, it's when I seem to some reason I reach the chocolate. And uh, so we talk through things, and... Basically, I'm cutting, going to cut down the Iron Brew to two large cans of 1901 per live. So the same stuff I took with me on the trip uh, on the uh, over New Year's and had with me around me because it's very very nice. And um, yeah, if I, I if I've dropped down to four cans of Iron Brew a week, that will cut down my carbohydrate and sugar intake. Pretty much to nothing. Plus, I got to see Stafford as well. Meeting Stafford was cool. Because Stafford has been... And all the other people in Canada, um, Sean, etc. But meeting Stafford was very, very cool. Because Stafford has been a fan of this channel from the beginning. And getting to meet him in person was a lot of fun as well in Canada. What I'll do is I'll do a naval book and a train book. <laughs> Make sure I don't tell you what I mean. It's not the broadcast live, right? <laughs> eh, she doesn't watch the video. She, she, uh, uh, to, uh, to her, she says, um, she watches me in real life. She doesn't need to see me on the video as much. Make sure, Dr. Clark, as for steam engines, what do you say is the crossover between sails with auxiliary steam to steam with auxiliary sails, the, i.e., the golden age of the hybrid ship? It honestly goes on for a long, long time. And if you're looking at HMS Warrior, she, of course, has steam engines and sails. And she has, at her time, the best of both. And it's as engines get more reliable, they get less and less fussed about quite how good a sail system they have. But it's basically, sails are going to stay until they have reliable fuel supplies. Not happening. You're cute. You're not cute enough for me to face that amount of uh, amount of me being in trouble. Yes, because your papa would get in trouble, wouldn't he? Because you get podge podge, and you have to go see the vets at some point soon, and they'll weigh you, and they'll tell me off. So anyway, in 1913, Queen Victoria's children start dropping like flies. Due, uh, so that in July 1914, Wilhelm II becomes king of the UK. What changes? Okay, let's work out just how many people would have to die. Wilhelm II in line to you line to British throne. At the time he was born, he was sixth in line in succession to the British throne after his maternal uncles, but. You would have to kill off grandchildren. 
yeah, th there are just so many you'd have to kill off. But let's say there is a major explosion for somehow, and it wipes out the entire royal family, and Wilhelm II does become... Uh, then he finds himself in a very problematic thing, because he can't combine the two states. And he finds one where he's a constitutional monarch with very limited power, and another one where he's an, auto uh, where he's an autocrat. And in nicest way, I think no, no, I don't think anything could... I, I think, actually, he might be skipped. I think, honestly, an act of parliament might be passed skipping him. Especially in 1913. Which could mean to him trying to declare war to reclaim his rightful throne, but I'm fairly sure the British state would, as a whole, go, we will pick anyone rather than you. Favourite ship name? I mean, the borough. Favourite ship name? Ooh. HMS. Ooh. You see, I like all the. I, I do like all the tribals, but I have a. I have a soft spot for HMS Subian. Coming up with an amphibious Schleifen. Could be Belgium persuaded with nice words, hard currency, and a cute, honestly, just strolling around the visions to open a land corridor with the Germans. The Belgians might actually, if the Germans are successful enough, the Germans, uh, the Belgians might actually let German logistics pass through Belgium, but not troops. They might, if they think the French are going to fall, then they might let the Germans go take their trains through Belgium, because the, Bel the Germans are honouring the Belgian neutrality. He has lied down as close to the biscuits as he can physically get behind me. So if you see me being very careful about how I move my chair, it's because I have a poodle who is now moving. So, so you're planning on today being Steam Engines 101? Um, lots of engines. Lots of engines. Now, for roughly research assistant is very good around books. Um, both of them are well trained about books. They don't touch books. There are things they will touch, but not books. They they will quite happily jump into my lap and possibly give me a hernia by where they they slam their paws. But they will be gentle with the books. I had priorities when training them. I mean, be careful of the things you don't see in Australia. They're the most dangerous things. I do realise this, and I've also got a book, The Vaccinations, I probably need for going to Australia. I'm fairly sure I'll need some vaccinations for going to Australia. Probably. The rack is supposed to be... Uh, the, the current crew, it will be the Canada Naval History crew. And it could be a few others as well, tagged along. But at the moment, it's the Canada Naval History crew, and we're organising it together. And it should be a lot of fun. It's going squad... We will never go... We will not go squad mode on Jamie with Nerf Guns, mainly because... I'm not sure if we can get Nerf guns through airport security. If I thought I could get a Nerf gun through airport security without causing trouble with the t with the various Australian customs, I might do that. Nice <laughs> Why did the RAF operate Banger class minesweepers? If it's, and I'm not 100% sure because I haven't got a book in front of me and I don't want to do a Google search on this one because then I will just be doing a Google search and just reading what's off on Wiki uh, because I doubt there's a specific website for them. 
But if it's, for the reason I remember, it's part of their pilot recovery systems because planes went down over the sea far too often. Hello, Ruhan. Just one. Ah, the King Ralph scenario. There are lots and lots of people who are distantly enough related to the royal family. I think... I think my family has managed to avoid marrying into them. Usually we've been their bodyguards and protectors. We've not, uh, we've managed to avoid marrying into them. Or being in any way connected that way. But... There are some stories which go down my family history about just how many rooms they have had to secure over their years of service. John Gregory, have you tried to walking? I was up to six miles one day. It worked well. It used to break it in three months. I have tried. I do. It's going to sound strange. My average daily step count used to be 30,000 steps a day when I was teaching in universities before COVID. And that's the big thing which I think has caused my weight to go up. That and not doing the daily gym. And once I get back to daily gym and I I will try, I take the dogs to the walk, etc. But the trouble is, my office is now literally... Well, it used to be in my bedroom, which was even worse. But now it's about a 40, 60 second commute to my office from my bedroom and then I can honestly end a spend the whole day sitting here so I am trying to get out of that habit, I've got a new fit, I will get a new Fitbit and etc in February and get myself organised but I'm doing the first cut out the bad food stuff which I've been basically using out of laziness and then get on to the exercise thing and hopefully, yeah, slim down a bit before I have to curl up into a ball on a plane. Didn't the submarine World War II sail home to Pearl Harbor using a bed lining? I, I think there's a story about that, but I've never been quite sure. I wanted to check out if it's true or not, because if it's true, that's great, but if it's not, then it's rather sad to learn it's not because it's rather a fun story so again this is one of those things once you get significantly sufficiently involved in history you get to the point where there are some stories you just don't look up because if you look them up you then have to know you then know if they're true or not and you don't want to know if they're true because you don't want to not be able to use that story enjoy history vanguard your hawkins class cruises uh, video is done that's cool Alfred B. Two Eight. What is your favourite after action report that you came across in your research? There was one after after action report from a torpedo boat commander, which literally read, "We found the enemy. We fired at the enemy. We think we sunk the enemy. We didn't hang around to make sure." Cool. Oh. Colin Cameron, the biggest change would be he can't be Kaiser on the UK law. He'd have to give up his claim if he wanted the year throne. Ah, uh, ooh. You see, there is enough ambiguity in the British law that he could actually theoretically be Kaiser and King of in and King of the UK. Could theoretically be both. Theoretically. Not really, but theoretically. I, I once had this conversation because I was talking about a few things with a constitutional law expert and um, the kind of constitutional law expert in the UK who gets called up by the government and people are seeking to stop the government doing stuff and can basically charge whatever they want. And I was lucky enough to have dinner sitting next to the person and so I was chatting away with them. And we were talking all about these interesting things rather than the current affairs. And I think they rather liked having this conversation with me because everyone else wanted to talk about various high-tension current affair issues at the time. And uh, they were rather sick of them. 
And there was me talking about going through World War One, the Kaiser, and a few other things. And it was all completely the, off the topic of what everyone else around us was trying to have a conversation about with them. So they loved it. But uh, yes, um, and basically the answer was... Uh, that would be an expensive one and would probably require an act of parliament to make it sure. It's the only things of you can be theoretically right on both sides, but theoretically, you're, realistically, act of parliament is the way you'll go. There is no major health crisis that could take two to three monarchs a, a monarch every two to three months. Do uh, don't take this the wrong way. But the British government has been securing monarchs from dying in major health crises for a long, long time. We have sent them everywhere. One of the reasons why the royal family has houses all over the frigging country is so you can send them away. Did the Long Lance sink more Japanese ships than Allied ships, which was 13 number, I think, Nicole Ross says. Um... Possibly, because it was possibly used to sink a few ships which were damaged and couldn't be got back to safety. You're missing the other solution. Purchase the Nerf guns locally in Upside Downland. I might well secure an Amazon delivery of Nerf guns to our hotel. So we arrive to the hotel, get our Nerf guns, see Jamie the next day and go, Yep, yeah. that sounds like a sensible idea. Very good. My son is, uh, we aren't recording most tack rolls in the UK. <laughs> Unfortunately, surname, both of my surnames ended up there. In fact, all my names did. Estrang on the steam engines are a large pressure vessel. If left uncontrolled, goes boom. Take this way, uh, well, take this way in Brighton. Show that nine F steam loco went up and the boiler ended a half mile away. That's not unusual. My family hasn't been in the UK since 1640s, and I have somehow have a connection to the royal family. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. No more McDonald's for me. Yes, no more takeaways. I'm having to be good. Oh. Night six, everyone. Why would the British convince the Americans not to go after the Gulf class SSB uh, K one two nine? They want it to do. How tall is your poodle at the shoulder? Um, at the shoulder. <sighs> He'd probably be from there to there quite happily. At the shoulder. When he rises up on his hind legs, he can. He's sort of looking me up almost very closely in the eyes, and he's as tall as my sister. Dundrian, it wasn't Victoria Empress of India while being Queen in England. Yeah, that that's the trouble. There are so many different titles attached to being a monarch. If you try and make the king that, oh, you can't also have this title of Kaiser of Germany as well as all these other titles which you get as being king or king or queen of England, it becomes an interesting, difficult one. And this it can confirm easier to quit nicotine hair than hair in the nicotine. I'm still amazed. My best friend managed to managed to um, quit sugar altogether. That's just a skill. Here's my sister into steam engines. Not really, but she, because both my mother and I are, 
<clears throat> she has to come on any steam train rides. Uh, both dogs have gone on steam trains. We're quite good. And I have actually managed to get... Um, R Raleigh has been, and Mozart, who before him, have all driven, have all ridden on the footplate on a steam train. They've had a lot of fun. I've got a picture somewhere of Mozart with his head out the driver's side window as it's going along, and he's got his goggles on, and he's just looking at hey, outside the steam train. Um, it was a castle class. And then you arrive on a nerf by Cockatoo Assassin stepping out of the airport building. Who knows what Jane will have ready for us? Who knows what Jane will have ready for us? Well, Colin Cameron, to keep airs healthy and out of the way is also one of the reasons you get towards the Empire. It does work rather well. You kept saying only because that something broke, and you never said what was only because of that. Claw broke. Um, yeah. I think that's to do with the recovery from the Glow Morris and, and the claw breaks, if I remember correctly, on the third attempt to recover stuff, or is it the second? <clears throat> right, is like Krakatoa was basically cracked heat engine that went boom. Yes. Seem riches. Are you trained in repelling emu attacks? I am worried about emus and kangaroos, and I am trained in dodging kangaroos. Emus less. But kangaroos, I've decided they're basically similar to poodles, and I'm experienced at dodging poodle paws. I let's put it this way, I get less black eyes than the rest of the family. So did some bribes like ever build a locomotive out of a naval engine to transport the engine from factory to shipyard? No, but several ships actually had what were basically locomotive engines in them. Because at a certain, for a certain time, basically, uh, the idea was that you would use both. It, it didn't matter. It, what was, it was basically the engine. And you'd have sim very similar engines used for standing steam engines and mines. And the same steam engines would be used on trains. And then the steam engines would be used on ships and slowly they adapt them as they they basically start off from a common pool and then they sort of adapt and adapt and eventually you get to a point where you cannot use a steam engine from a ship on a train you cannot use a standing a standing engine from a train on a, a standing engine from a mine on a train or on a ship they're very very different Haynes magnets were from me I thought they were Dan thank you I couldn't remember. I thought they were from you, but I've had so many books over the Christmas period, I honestly couldn't remember which... be 100% sure whose was whose. Paul Beswick, any comment on the supposed cancellation of Type 32? We already covered this in the bilge pumps when I said that Type 32 is probably bound to get cancelled. It will be Type 31 Batch 2. And the whole idea of it being a second project and being a second... The moment you make it another new class of ship i.e. Type 32, rather than Type 31 at Batch 2, you have to rerun the bidding. And you have to do all that stuff. And honestly, it's going to be pointless because BAE are going to be building the Type 26, and then whatever comes after for the uh, Type 83. And that means you've only really got one option for building your Type 32s, which the same people are building the Type 31. But if you call it Type 32, you have to run through all the expensive bidding prices again. Or you can just go, we're ordering Batch 2 Type 31s. And you're fine. One is, it, it, one can get you into lawsuits, an interesting territory under various people being annoying. And one can... Well, one can get the job done. Carver's a cockatoo can say Mr. Seedell sends his regards. Yeah.
Doctor, Doctor, uh, Doctor C, when you get to US, you need to swing by the Henry Ford Museum Village. Steam trains out the wazoo inside and running one outside. Ooh, cool. Well, I will have to go make sure I get there at some point. Hi, uh, Richards. Friggin', I had the unfortunate task of riding the flying Scotsman, the new Peppercorn class footplate as security. That would be fun, but interesting. Can see for when did the UK GB English monarch officially stop being King Queen of France? Could cause issues with Kaiser Bill and the job. Uh Let's put it this way. It's something which I think Henry VIII even retains the claim to at certain points. I'm trying to remember which... Maybe one of the Stuarts gives it up, but I'm doubtful. Nick Ross, I was looking at the Typhoon Cobra. Was a ship roll of 60 degrees, 30 and 30, or 60 and 60? The joy of the thing is, the uh, uh, sometimes they don't really aren't clear in how they say it. Because if you're talking about in the US Navy or the Royal Navy, you would be talking about a 60 degree movement. If you're talking about the Japanese at that time, it could be... Mm. <clears throat> Let's what I say. We'll say sixty degrees of movement because that's what it's supposed to be. You just made a sea slug. Thought you'd be fascinated. What do you mean the missile or the animal? Very cool, very good. Biscuits for the underfunded fluffy research assistants. You've got far too many fans, fluffy one. <sighs> but a train with an hour class steam engine would be fun to see. It would be fun to see, it would not be around for long. Um, I think we are, I think I have about, I think the current flight we're looking at is the Singapore Airlines, is my mind. But I'm not 100% sure. And that is a stop in Singapore, I think. But I think we're also, we have, we're still working through these things. Our entire, our entire, Dr. Clark, the only railway museum near Chicago is worth at least a day out. I think, honestly, when I eventually do my US tour, which I am going to do at some point, I don't know if we do it as a combined group because Drac has already done pretty much a tour of all the ships in the US. He might like to do it again and basically be a tour guide, but I, I, I doubt he. I, I, I'm not sure if he want to. Um, but I am considering at some point, it would be, let's put it this way, it would be on my list of things I would like to get to, but first, I want to do this Australia one this year, and I also want to do, it's going to sound strange, I want to try out a shorter range, shorter one, on my own first, because I haven't done a solo foreign tour filming for the channel yet, I've done Canada, with all the gang. I've done some trips around the UK on my own, and I've done some trips with friends. As you saw for uh, Warrior, I took friends with me. 
and we had more show up and it was a lot of fun including Dan was there so we had a lot of fun and the the, the scariest person for me to ever have around uh, meeting new people because she has so many stories about me and unlike family I do not have baby photos to be able to coerce silence from her with was my best friend who was there and chatting away Sam but she didn't share anything too much And, um, yeah, so I, I, there are some... It's slowly building up. I think, I think I'm probably going to try Norway on my own first. Because I've been to Norway. I, I know Norway well enough that going there on my own for filming doesn't really worry me. I believe the British monarchy abandoned their claim to French throne at or about the French Revolution. Might be wrong. Probably for political reasons, that was a time when it was probably dropped. That would make sense. The missile. Ah, that's that. That's better than other things. Could have been. Honestly, I was wondering about the biology of making your own sea slug. I don't know, why would the US be allowed to do what is a desecration of grave and act of war? When the, what the frigate, Doc? Because it's gathering intelligence, Knight 6031, and sometimes, it, this is going to sound strange, the ends justify the means, despite how distasteful the means might be, in that time, but in that time and context and nuance, it is justified. It's not nice, but international relations isn't always about being nice. In fact, quite often it's the exact opposite. It's about doing what's necessary, which can be very, very not nice. Mm. Qantas or BAA flights. Singapore Airlines seems cheaper. Every time I do the Google search, they seem to come up as the, cheap, uh, as the cheapest ones of the flight of the um, carriers I've flown with before. If you put a steam engine on the Blackburn Blackburn, would the aesthetics improve? No. And just no. We're just going with no for that one. The aesthetics would not improve. It's all sorted, ready to go. Right then. Margooch, how long does it take to start up a ship's steam engine from cold to ready to move? And how does this change through the ages? It changes a lot through the ages. Um, it gets quicker as time goes on. It's nowhere near the instantaneous power you get with a gas turbine. Or a nuclear reactor. Well, relatively instantaneous power you get. It's your talking hours. For all of them. But... Probably in most destroyers, if you've got from a cold start, I everything's cold, you are pro in World War Two. You're probably talking a couple of hours. 
it depends. You can do things faster if you don't care about what damage you might do. Take care, Amelia. What steam locomotives would you visit here in America if you could? I would track down every single one of the surviving big boys. That there is no, there is no hesitation on that. I, I like those, those big, the big steam engines. I go for the really big ones. When in America, look for the really big ones. Right. Short History of Naval Marine Engineering by Edgar C. Smith. This is a good, good book. Now, first thing to note about it. And this is important to think about. Is when it's published. This is published in 1938. This version. So, the year before World War II. This paperback edition is part of, printed as of 2013, but the original book published in 1938. And this is why I like it. Sir, so I would have should have wrote to you before of our arrival at arrival at Deptford, but have been so busy employed in towing ships about that I have not an hour, a hour since I left Kronstadt in Russia. We left in on the first of July in company with the Gloucester seventy four. After beating and towing her at time, we were ten days and nights before we made Copenhagen. After working that time, my water in the boilers did not exceed a temperature of 216 degrees. By my blowing some water from the boilers several times a day, we took our departure from Copenhagen on the 13th. Inst. And then went into port in Norway in a gale of wind on the 17th. Inst. At this place, Biggs departed on the 19th inst. this life and was buried there. Uh, te there, the temperature of the water and boilers did not exceed 216 degrees. Took our departure from Egerson in Norway on the 21st, in uh, 21 inst, uh, first, and the made Sheerness on the 24th inst, which made our uh, running better than 200 miles in four and twenty hours. When we came to Sheerness, we ran to Chatham and then towed a 74 from Sheerness to near Chatham. Left Sheerness for Deptford on the 24th inst, and then the next day towed a ship from Woolwich to the Nore, and then back to Deptford tomorrow. We towed a barge from this to the Downs or near Dort Portsmouth with the Ambassador, things that has going on in the gun ranges, and then returned back to Deptford immediately. So the temperature of the water in the North Sea is 20, 214, and the temperature in my boilers did not exceed 218. So that I never put my fire out nearly the old of the voy old voyage, and when I took my manhole off the boilers, of it was as clean as a pair of new ones in my um, my engines. His good his good is is in good good repair, as when I left England. It's really it's really written in its old English. This one. This is by the way writing in roughly eighteen twenty six. From the steam vessel Lightning. So, yeah, it's fun. So that I never put my fire out nearly the old of the voyage, and when I took my man all off the boilers, was as clean as a pair of new ones. My engines, his is in, good re uh, in as good a repair as when I left England. The main pipe joint under boilers gave way, give way, but I repaired that so that it is as tight as ever. But my front plates round the fire doors is getting bad, and my clutch on the paddle wheels is get loose by being in such heavy seas. Mr. Mosley have been on board, and it gave him great pleasure to see the engines in so good a state after such a long journey. Sir, I hope that you will send to the board to know what if I am to have the boat or know as we belong to your department, for I have not, had no, no time to see them or write. So then I hope that you will do me that favour and let me know, sir, as soon as uh, possible, or some recommendations for bringing home the vessel as I am at Deptford. I have two or three places to go if the, the Don give me the situation. I've had charge of the engines from the 4th of June when we left Kronstadt to look for the Duke 
I have had a forgotten time of it in Algiers. It was nothing to compare to this journey. So it means your own most humble, humble or obedient servant, John Chapander, acting engineer of Her Majesty's ship Lightning. This original letter is preserved in the Science Museum Library with the Goodrich Papers. It's accompanied by another paper dated November the 8th, 1926, in which Chapander acknowledges with gratitude his appointment. But Chapander did not venture, did not give, uh, but evidently did not give satisfaction, as in Goodrich's notes of founders' entries, said the Rifford, writing about Chapander. Uh, 5th of the 5th, 27th, Saturday, at, Dry, Dry, at, Di at Didford Dry Do uh, Dockyard, writing about Chapander. 7th, 5th of the 27th, send on report for removal of Chapander from the Lightning. 11th of the 5th, 27th, further explanation about Chapander. 7th of the 6th, 27th, recommended Jenin for the first engineer of the Lightning. Early marine engineering practice is also illustrated by the story of the Enterprise, the vessel for which it was hoped to establish the communications with India. Meetings of officials and merchants had been held in London in 1822, and in Calcutta in 1823, to consider the project. The government of India had offered 20,000 rupees to any British subject who had permanently established steam communications, either via the Cape or the Red Sea, before the end of 1826. Funds being forthcoming, the enterprise, then on the stocks of Gordon and Company, Deptford, was purchased, and Lieutenant J.H. Johnson, Royal Navy, one of the chief promoters, was chosen a commander. The Enterprise was 122 feet long on the keel, 27 foot beam, and 479 tons burden. And into her moulds leaves fitted one large copper flue boiler and a two cylinder side lever engine with cylinders 43 inch in diameter and 4 foot stroke. Driving paddle wheels 20 foot in, diam in diameter. Gear was supplied for holding the weight wheels when the ship was under sail. In the engine room were brine pumps for the discharging water from the boilers and refrigerators for heating the incoming feed water by the outgoing brine. Much of the coal was carried in iron tanks, which when emptied would be, could be filled with seawater to ensure a proper immersion of paddle wheels. <coughs> the vessel cost £43,000. <sighs> Although often referred to, no full account of the voyage has been published. But in the field papers presented a few years ago to a science museum library by Miss Gertrude Field, a granddaughter of Joshua Field, are a copy of John Lieutenant Johnson's log up to the time the vessel arrived at Cape. And a letter written from Calcutta to Henry Morsley by William Ash, the engineer of the ship. Leaving Falmouth on August the 16th, 1825, with 17 passengers and a small quantity of cargo, ship reached Cape Town on October the 13th and Calcutta on December the 7th. Though she did not fulfil the conditions necessary to attain a reward, Enterprise was purchased by the Indian government, who employed her in running dispatches from between Calcutta and Rangoon, and she is heard of again when the mail service to India via Alexander in Suez had been started. The log is too long to be reproduced, but one or two extracts will be helped illustrate the problems that are confronted the Void Commanding Officer. During his two-month voyage to the Cape, Lieutenant Johnson had many anxieties and difficulties to contend with, some of which arose from the distribution of coal in tanks in various parts of the ship. For days together, the ship must have been like a collier. But both passengers and crew bore, with those disagree uh, disagreeables with much consideration, the first entry reads, Tuesday, August the 16th, 1825. Drafts of water forward 15 foot, uh, aft 15 foot 3 inches. At 7.30, he cast off from the mooring buoy and uh, proceeded down the channel. 9.30, passed the lizard light. Engines going 22 strokes. Temperature 224 degrees. Speed 6.5 uh, miles per hour. Light breeze from the northwest. I do keep looking at these degrees and going, is it 22.4 degrees or 224 degrees? It seems to be 224. There's no full stop I can see. But it's interesting. It's a good book if you're interested in the short history of naval and marine engineering. And it's written in its time, and it's an interesting read to read from a book from the 1930s. 43,000 rupees. I don't know, 43,000 pounds? I forget. <sighs> hmm. And for him, so playing catch up. Happily go to Norway on holiday if you want a cameraman. <sighs> Don't tempt me, I might well drag you. Um.
Henry Dragon, the history of the railway steam line goes to the start in cold. Two to twenty-four hours, or they have been fired the day before. Three to four hours. Good luck with your wallpaper stripping at Stafford. Mr. Serenius, I heard that both, Joe, that both Joe and America were reluctant to buy Parsons Marine steam turbine painting due to cost. Do you know the price range they were looking at? Parsons were trying to charge as much as they could get away with. But no, I haven't ever seen the documents which relate to how much they are planning on charging them. Reference, did Nevada suffer damage or engines because of the way they started in the drone attack? I think that was one of the things they refitted. And repaired. Could the RN run of a hundred plus hunt class? The hunter had all of a hundred plus. Had the RN. Eh? I, I, nice everyone. Can you repeat the hunt class question? Because that doesn't really read like a question. And you need to explain which hunt class do you mean? Are you talking about the hunt class minesweepers or the hunt class escort destroyers? Because they ordered a hundred plus of those. And a hundred plus were in service. Now, so what about just timing a trip so you can go for a journey pulled by a big boy? Oh, I will try that shamelessly. Look, in nicest way, I am trying to work in. Well, a couple of us are trying to work in a steam train journey into the Australia trip. Well, a train journey, not a steam train, is hardly enough. Dragged on 12. Dr. Lot, I'm having to do my first research paper for my history degree. And my professor is allowing me to do a non traditional style of his research paper. Any ideas for how to go about it? If you're being allowed to use a non traditional style, you can't hide behind the traditional format. So my advice would be to find a very good journal article recently published on the topic, or book recently published on the topic. Go to the list of sources in the back, and mind them sh as much as you possibly can. Because it's going to sound strange, but normally if I was... And I'm sure your professor's not doing it because of this. When I hear the phrase is non-traditional... The, fr the thing that flashes in my head is, IT'S A TRAP! Uh, because non-traditional means you can write it as you like, but it also means you can write it as you like, so it's all on you. Just on, didn't any Navy keep their ships half warm? It was normal to keep. Some of the ships would be kept spooled up, let's say. They'd have one boiler, one or two boilers actually running. In Especially in the bigger ships that take longer to work up. Oh, thank you. Goodness. I thought for a second I was wondering it was me because I was living close to me. Yeah, you are wonderful. Silent ones, eh? I need to fix that lock. Ah, oh, luckily it's one of three. But I need to fix it. Yeah. Yeah, I've had to do that because of you. Norway is a very cool place to go to. And Norwegians are lovely people. And... The main thing is it's kind of, it, 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 it's, how do I put this? 
Norway and Sweden, and, and if I did go to do Norway, I'd want to pop across to look at Sweden as well, because I've got great naval history. I don't think you could do Norway, Sweden, and Finland and do all their naval history in one go. Uh, but you can do a fair chunk of Norway and Sweden together, and then you could do Sweden and Finland to finish it off. Another trip, but yeah. That's what I'm sort of thinking about. Ah. Uh. Just one. Got the biographies of Kirk, Picard, and Jamie for my cake day today. Shame we didn't include Cisco and or Archer. Yeah, but let's be honest. Cisco's uh, Cisco's biography is probably under so many different forms of the official secret act. It'll never come out. And Archer's, well, he'd have had to actually like any biographer for them to actually do, uh, for anyone to actually do an official proper biography of him. And honestly, the odds are he just didn't want to spend his entire time. And let's be honest, quite a lot of it would not be very good for the Vulcans if that came out. So they're probably behind its suppression. Why did they remove the original engineer? He died. And then his second in command took over. And he turns out to be interesting. You purchased a Railway Empire game. I am currently looking for a good railway game because Railroad Tycoon 3 doesn't work well on this PC. It doesn't. It, um, how do I put it politely? You see, this PC has two screens. And Railroad Tycoon 3 is one of those games which does not like two screens. Another sleeve slug leaves the production line. Tana America, are you by any chance either trying to equip the Royal Navy in the 1970s or are you building a modern warship while listening to me? I, 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 it's very fine if you're doing the latter. I'd just like to know which ship, because I'm now, I'm, now, I'm now interested. And I'm nosy. Yeah, she's in the summer of working on Valgate. Oh. Uh, Dan, of course, uh, Flight Raccoon, the Hunt Class Escorts, after Green Lives and Company operate occupations, will this have worked out better than Flowers? They were already building them. This is one of the things. Hunt Class Escort Destroyers and Flowers are both ordered prior to World War II. But the thing is, Hunt Class require a certain cap capability of yard, whereas Flowers can be built in any yard. So the thing is, it's about maximizing your available capable yards. You can build flowers in far more yards than you can build hunts, but in a yard that you can build a hunt, there is not much point in building a flower, because a hunt is a far better tool. So the more hunts you get, great, but what would be better is if they managed to order the hunts, I don't know, and started their construction in 1937 38. And if they'd started them a lot earlier and they got into service a lot earlier, there would have been a very big problem for the Germans in World War Two, because the amount of escorts available for the fleet for the convoys would have gone dramatically way uh, dramatically up a lot earlier before the surge in submarines. As it was, they sort of matched each other. Mm-hmm. They built 86. They could have probably built a few more. But after they see the trouble here, what stops the Hunt Class Escort destroying its mass production is... A, the war emergency destroyers. And B, then you have the yards which could have taken, could have, could have taken on them were ta uh, handed over to the river class frigates. Well, 
which got quite a lot of them, uh, quite a lot of them. And that's basically what that's basically all she wrote. Sort of, it's one of those problems for the hunt class escort destroyer. If they start off earlier, they get a lot more produced. But the trouble is when they come into service and they're in in use, and there's good in use. They are not going to be around forever because, frankly, there are things which come in. And then it's a case of, okay, right then. So in this yard, I can build this full-blown destroyer rather than a hunt-class escort destroyer. I'll build that. And this yard, I can build a hunt-class escort destroyer in this time. Or I can build this kind of frigate in, X, in Y time. Y is slightly less than X. I'll build the frigates because I can get more of them out in time. And then in other yards, I can't build frigates, but I can build class of class corvettes. So why would I build hunt class? Because I probably can't. Because uh, those are probably going to be better for me as well, and also quicker. So it, it's the trouble is the hunts are good, but the thing is they are the first generation of war emergency build, but they are ordered pre-war, like the flowers. Did the FRA use chemical weapons? Yes. No snow yet. Uh, Rapid Raceway, looks like I need a good book or two on the PBY pack, Catalina. You find one, I will take it as a recommendation. So far, the ones I've read, I wouldn't really recommend to other people. They're either hopelessly basic in that you probably get more from, I don't know, looking at the average website, They're at, or they are so absurdly focused in and academic on one on one sort of operation one specific thing that they don't give you an overview of the overview of the type at all C ah hms norfolk can class ddg yes that is very cool and a lot of fun tanifarka glad to hear she's getting some love hello george human So I've been around Dover Castle Day, and yet again I went around myself because I have too many questions for the tour guide and wanted to correct them a few times. Uh, it's it, it sometimes is a nicer thing to not go with the tour. How do the German respond to Marin building an armada of ASW ships? Well, you'd think it'd be by surging submarine construction, but honestly, the unfortunate thing for the Navy is submarine construction is under the office of the five-year plan, which is run by Hermann Goering. Which basically says all you need to know about that. Eventually, they do get transferred to the control of Albert Speer, and things start to improve... But, yeah. It takes time. It does take time. And let's go for a ship book. I mean, train book. Mm hmm. That'll be cool. Bum, bum, bum.
Now, this is going to be a good one. Let's see if I can find the section I found earlier. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> well, yeah, it's all about the WDLR. Yes, that little railway that was built, which was quite so critical to things. I wondered why I was getting I was getting cold, but not quite so cold as I was expecting to get on. And uh, my good old radiator was triggered by the temperature and went, Pump out heat! Must save the dwellings! Must save the books from getting too cold or too hot! So, this is one of those books which is... Honestly, not so much. The writing is interesting and it's worth reading, but it's one of those books where you don't read it for the words. The words are useful, the words are nice, the words give nuance and context, but um, it's an album. And albums, the moment that a book's called an album, you know what it's about. Oh yeah. It's about a rapid build railway. It's about logistics. Oh yeah. Honestly, it's what a current nation, which is currently right fighting a war invasion, would love to be building because they really don't do good road network logistics at the moment because they've lost so many trucks. Oh, and they love a good train. But everyone loves a good train. Well, if you're bad or nice, good or yeah, good or evil, you love a good train. If you if you're really evil and if you really don't love love a good uh, love a train, then you probably are really evil actually. But we'll leave that to one side. You know, it's kind of like people who who try and make it as a war between cats and dogs. When the exact answer, the real answer is you want both in as many numbers as possible. You know, you want all the pets. Personally, I wouldn't have guinea pigs, cats, and dogs, but that's mainly because I think the moment you get down to the guinea pig level, you just are asking for a guinea pig to be chased by a cat, to be chased by the dog. To be chased by you. Lots and lots and lots of cool drawings, lots and lots of cool pictures. Trains. And this is basically World War One logistics. And this is the point. World War One logistics. It is a really cool book. A uh, new IKB4472 is the gentleman who's loaned me this book. I will be getting it back to him at some point. It comes with maps as well. Always useful for looking the spread of the railways. And how a railway network would be designed. So. I'm just check the key. So. Blue line. If you can see that, that's your standard gauge railway. Then this colour, the sort of brownish colour, is the 60 centimetre light railway lines. If they're green, they're the 60 centimetre distribution lines and Royal Engineers Corps Corps of Tranways. And if they're these red ones, they're the Royal Engineers Divisional Ropeways or Trolley Lines, which are designed to get stuff right to the front. So this is what you have going on. And you'd also have some roads. These. Mainly made of stone. These are am ammunition transships. Points. Bulk delivery points. Back here. And here. And an ammunition depot. Which would be down the divisional. Divisional. Corpse, heavy, well, I think that's heavy artillery depot, dump, 
Um, various ammunition depots down here. Casualty clearing stations all the way back here. Always keep people like Dr. Dan nice and away from the action. You need them safe so they can actually look after you when you get injured. If they're all the way up here, you're going to have trouble. Because they're medics and they believe in helping people, no matter how likely it's going to get them killed. And then you have all the logistics. So just think about this. This is all logistics because these roads just couldn't be designed to take enough trucks. Because there weren't really enough trucks available. So all this is in place. And this will be repeated up and another, along and along and along each way. Until they came to another blue line. And some of those blue lines are built in as well. <clears throat> and because artillery did like to aim for the railway lines, I can't think why. One of the reasons why the railway lines were designed to be so quickly and easily repaired was because artillery did like to hit them, so they would often be having to rebuild lines quite quickly. Fill in, put the line track over... Hope you don't have an unexploded shell in the bottom of the pit you just filled in. Not unusual. Could go off when the train run was over. Might not go off till the 2023. Who knows? And this is the Western uh, Western Bo uh, uh, Western Brett uh, hmm, Western Hook Hook H O E K Martian Yard on the 7th of March 1918. It is a really... Yeah, Dan, you say you're a coward, but you're also the only one who had the nerve to try and wind up the... Uh... Chief Stoker of HM HMCS Hyda. So, you know, you can say you're a coward, but, you know, you have a lot of nerve. And there you go. The train with... Things in there for scale. Bit with fascine and roll over it. Yep, exactly. Exactly. I trust the fluffy research assistant is wearing a sweater. No, he isn't at the moment. He's had it taken off him. Take care, Stephen. Cool. Todd Webb, watching Dr. Hell Clark while eating Waffle House. See, I start off by saying I'm having a diet, I'm trying to sort of diet, and then you mention Waffle House. You're just torturing me now. This is just not, this is, this is historian torturing. Broken. Are the troy line the scenario for rather like roller coaster hook on tow things? Um, to an extent, but they're roller coasters, but they're usually, if I remember correctly, petrol powered trolleys. And literally, these little sort of petrol powered vehicles, which tiny cab and designed to be as low profile as possible. What is the cold? For He's currently lying against the radiator. Don't worry. He's hot. I have a lovely. Pro uh, I have a 2000 watt radiator in here. I don't need it for this space, but I have it in here because at the time when I bought it, the price differential was you could buy a 1000 watt for £90, a 1500 watt of the same make for £100, or a 2000 watt for £110. And it seemed sensible to just go, well, I'll just get overkill. And then I'll guarantee to have enough because my sister 
was going, oh, I won't need a radiator, there's so much thermal insulation, I will tell you the mathematics of this, 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 and I'm sort of going, yeah, but here is the thing, out of the two of us, I'm the one who's done the most building on this project, uh, and I've had to rebuild what's been built, and I know exactly what's happened to it, and I fixed it, everything's fine, but I'm still going to have a decent heater. And so I do. And I think I might be having to fill in a gap with some orange paint at some point. I did paint it all, but before I put the railway in, I thought, I'll wait, it, let it leave a while, and then I'll add in some more paint. Because I'm guaranteeing some of the joints will fill apart because of the way the wood expands and contracts. <sighs> You were those originals? <sighs> Cruelty. Ron, is it just me or are the turbines for warships deceptively small for the house power going through them? Yes, but there again, they're usually small for that reason. I like waffles. I like waffles from Waffle House. I like waffles which are Belgian waffles. And I like potato waffles. Again? What have we been feeding you? Oh my... Oh. Send a gas mask! God. Ah. Holy. <laughs> Why do I have to, I had to rebuild the office when it, well, let's put it this way. Um, there are some videos somewhere which we might go up someday of me and Drac rebuilding this office because basically it was built by the builders. Then we found the builders hadn't done the job properly and he and I pretty much had to take the whole thing apart again and rebuild it. And I rebuilt that entire wall was started off by me and Drac and then finished by me. The shelving was all done by me. Uh, outside wall sections, roofing sections have been done by the both of us. The gutterings have been, uh, guttering has been rebuilt by both of us. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to be adding an extra layer of ceiling tar on the roof at some point before we put in anything else up there. And it, it's basically, it's been, it, it's been done to the highest degree by, for that reason. Uh, because me and Drac have basically rebuilt it all. But it wasn't built to stand. And we also had to fix the concrete base. Because the concrete base was floating in midair and was not designed to float in midair. And had things like styrofoam cups, etc. and stuff put underneath it as the core it was resting on and well other things which were less sanitary so there is actually yeah and um, there is a hammer around here somewhere which drac managed to break trying to get stuff out the mighty arm of Drakenafell broke my hammer he very nicely gave me a new one so i really can't complain it's just but he broke a hammer that takes skill very nice. A two kilowatt he uh, heater can be nudged down, but an eight hundred watt can't be nudged up. True. Um, don't question, but since this is a steam engine one, do we think we can ever expect to see the Flying Scotland return to her single chimney configuration that she supported for most of her career and still see her on the main line? Would she still have enough power to do the job given the modern timetable network demands? Hate seeing those smoke deflectors. Um, honestly, I doubt it because that seems to be what the, the National Row Museum want to keep her as, from what I understand. But they're not one of the museums I have the closest association with. Despite the fact every time I pass through York, I visit them. In fact, I have been known to... Basically, 
there are many of my colleagues who would say you can do certain trips, i.e. Newcastle back to the, uh, back to Epsom in one day. I do never have done Newcastle to Epsom on either on, on the in in the car in one day ever. I have always stopped in York. I have a hotel outside York which I always stop in. It's very nice. It has a swimming pool. It's just to the south of York. It's far enough out of the centre that it's quiet, but close enough you can be at the Roman Museum within about 15 minutes. And um, I usually stop there for about uh, a day, wander around the Roman Museum, see the Norv uh, the uh, Jorvik Centre, wander through the High Street, go to the tea shop, of course, and go to the cathedral, and then dry carry on my drive home. Because the Royal Museum is that good. And because York is a nice place to stop. But honestly, it's not that far from Newcastle. It really isn't. Are you doing your farting for your sweater? Is that your form of protest? No, I, Stafford, I am happy to build something. Trust me, there are things coming up which, well, if we get the plan, if we do what we're sort of planning on doing as a family, you could see a lot of construction later on this year because there is a whole discussion going through my family at this point about what we're going to do. The, the, the main trouble for the builders is because, as I've said before, uh, thanks to my dad, my grandfather, and the rest of my fa my family history, I am actually a very good carpenter. When I say good carpenter, I mean not very good amateur carpenter. I know enough to know what looks right, and to be able to well fix things. In this case, cobble together from bits they've broken, which they weren't supposed to use, because they were being quite so wasteful with the wood. I was sort of going, "Hang on, you're, you, there's a huge number of offcuts, and actually, these pieces." were are mostly off cuts because they weren't using the right bits of wood for the right things and um so that's why that sort of wall is looks like it is because it is actually off cuts which are being put together there is an entirely manufactured by me from different off cuts plank all the way along there yeah hello you want a biscuit and it's um they just, yeah, me and Drac were looking around and then then they tried to have the... Uh, Drac is, of course, a civil engineer. My sister is also a civil engineer, but she's a chartered civil engineer. So she is a sort of civil engineer squared. And they actually used the words, uh, well, dear, you know, it's very complicated building this structure. And my sister was looking at him going, uh, my average project is things like designing the systems which will stop London being flooded. This is a shed. There is a level... Of, you're, you're trying to use words which you don't know the meaning of and I do. Hello, Diego. There we go. How do you get these bits in your eye? And then you want to eat it. It's just kind of, you've got a weird bit in your eye. You're not eating it. I'll put it through the window. <sighs> not eating it. Yeah. I can recognise when I've completely mucked up. Yes, of course. That's a basic. That, that's a basic requirement of being an uh, being anything uh, good at anything. Recognising when you. Uh, have actually made a mis massive mistake. Um, let's do.
It is cool. It's well, the 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 thing is, okay. This is the story for me and Drac. Okay, he's probably one of the best friends I've made, and one of the best friends I've got. Uh, I've got, and really love working with him. Really love chatting with him. Just hanging out with him is fun and exciting. But I've worked with his brother for years. We work at the same uni, and he was taught by my sister. And neither of those two thought to bring us together. Neither. Okay, we find each other over YouTube. We deci I decided this was a conspiracy to keep us apart, frankly. Just a conspiracy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mr. Night Time Originals, I think the main problem running steam old steam trains on mainline is the infrastructure just in there, calling water stations, and they don't make sense to build. No, but I do live in the I, I do live in hope that some billionaire decides instead of producing rockets to go into space and try and enrich themselves even more. They actually decide we're going to add in a few water sta uh, rebuild a few water stations and coaling positions for steam trains on the British main line. Come on, I still haven't forgiven the National Rail Museum for breaking my grandfather's locomotive. You always have to remember, once it's a national museum. There are going to be people who are solid experts in it. There are also going to be people who are making decisions out of hope rather than necessarily knowledge. And they said, words they don't know the meaning of, how adorable. Yes, it was fun. Uh, and then when they said, well, you know, can we talk to your brother? He he might understand this. And the brother was sort of came out and went, yeah, I understand enough to know you're talking twaddle, but that's the Charter Civil Engineer. This is the Historian. Yeah, basically, my bookshelf is cobbled together from offcuts left over by them. There are a few bits of stabilisation in that, I have to admit. There are a few bits of stabilization wood where I have just basically gone. I'm reinforcing this. It's like uh, there's a bit over there because there was a bit of wood which was just looked a bit creaky, so I added that bit in and all sorts of things. But, you know, I had plenty of offcuts, so I could do it. And honestly, I concentrated more on building that, the higher ones out of the better quality wood and then thought, hang on, this is going to be the wood which is on the, on the television, or actually seen by people the other end. But... The, uh, the, my theory was this was going to be the most supported of the shelves and have the most structural support. So I had to build the higher uh, higher shelves out of the better quality wood. And then this stuff, this one's built triggering securely. It, the, the, you would not realize how much weight is put on that on a regular basis. Oh, well, this interrupted uh, the Who album. I'll listen. Hello, Frank. I am. Um, I interrupted the Who album. I feel bad now because I like the Who. Hmm. I did love the way that they thought that I was going to back up them over my sister. I, I thought that was, you know, a brilliant one. Um, you, f in the nicest way, A, I live with this person. You think I'm going to really pick the person who goes away and leaves me here over the person who has access to all this how all the house I stay in at the moment uh, 24 hours a day and can do nasty things to me. 
uh, versus over you, and B, chartered civil engineer, person who knows enough about woodwork to know uh, to know that you are talking twaddle in in the first place, and you're still trying it. Yeah, this isn't going to work. It, no, Santa Clara, it wasn't far off. If it hadn't been for it being the centre of COVID, we probably would have walked to see each other. Because we are within walking distance. And so, that will be fun. Pick everybody building some of the track pans, water the troughs for some of the railways had. Yeah, I think you could also come up with a way of doing that. Genome, if the Title 19 of the Washington Treaty, based on what it hadn't been signed, what is the likelihood the US would have built a strong base in Guam or Philippines during the 20s and 30s? Heavily, because it would be a great thing to do and relatively cheap. It would have looked great and looked like they were doing something while they didn't have to do anything. They could have justified anything by funding that base. They could have not funded the entire auxiliary supply. No, no fast tankers, nothing. Why? We've got this massive base in, in the Philippines. Thank you, Frank. Are there spur marks on your shelf? Not quite. But you have to remember, that isn't the made of wool flanking. So they left all these ten mil, uh, these hundred millimeter wide, exactly hundred mil wide, pretty much. Some of them are a little bit crooked, but hundred mil and mostly a smooth edge on most of them. Wide pieces of wood. And they had 70 mil and 50 mil wide ones. So I put all the 100 mil wide, 100 mil wise wide ones on these these rows. Then the 70, uh, 70 mil. Then and I had to replace some of them. I do admit I have to. I had to chop down some of them because I didn't have quite enough. But yeah. Thank you, Frank. Are you asking for a biscuit? <sighs> You're cute. Right then. This is the next book. Structural Design of Warships by William Hoggard. Now. This is one of those books which, if you're a naval architect or engineeringly minded, and you like to have the actual equations and the explanation of history of the equations... This is the book for you. Um, not sure if you can see, but there's entire pages of equations. I, it has been fun because this is one of those books which both me and my father had copies of. So Naval Architect had a copy of this and I had a copy of it. Uh, his copy has now disappeared off to one of his former students. One of his former, not, well he didn't have students, he had um, mentees. And some of the books which, uh, if any book which I had which was a repeat of what he had, I would, I'd give off of a, one of them, whichever one I felt like to, well, if his one had writing in it, I kept his copy. If it had nothing in it, I let his copy go. And it had nothing in it, the, his version of this one, but it did have, it is really, uh, these, it was really a good book and one he enjoyed. Uh, it has... Strength diagrams, always fun to have. And this is how to build and how to calculate your construction of your battle warship. And what is really fun is this book was originally published, originally written in 1915 by William Hovgard of Boston, Massachusetts, the United States. 1915. Hello. I know what you want, 
But if your mummy knows you're getting them quite so easily from your papa, she'll be very upset with your papa. Now, this is not music unless a ship sounds like moon. No. Ship columns, in general. In warships, columns occur chiefly as hollow or solid pillars or stanchions. Place the supports under the beams. The problem of column design is in ship construction less definite than in civil engineering, where the conditions under which compression members work can be more accurately determined. The magnitude of the load, statical and dynamical, which stanchions in a ship have to carry, is generally very difficult to estimate, and the structural members to which the stanchions are attached are subject to angular deflections and unsymmetrical loading, which will cause unknown secondary stresses in the stanchions. Cases are found, however, where a fair estimate can be made of the load, as when stanchions are fitted under barbettes, conning towers, boats or other heavy concentrated weights. Also, the load on stanchions placed between the keel and the central passage admits of at least a, at least a, a uh, comparative estimate. Secondary stretches can be indeed be practically avoided by using pin-ended stanchions, but ship stanchions are nearly always fixed at the ends, being riveted to the hull structure. This method is preferred probably because it is simpler and cheaper, and because it gives at least apparently a greater solidity. It may not, however, always be the best, and there are some cases where, as explained below, pin-ended stanchions should unquestionably be used. Columns may break down in two distinctly different ways, by instability or by a gradually increasing strain. In both cases, the breakdown is ultimately due to bending. But there is a difference that in condition or in stability. When the load reaches a certain magnitude, the smallest deviation from the ideal central loading will cause instant and complete collapse. Even... Although the stress is at that time everywhere within the elastic limit, whereas by the latter mode the column of moder at moderate eccentric loads bends over to the certain position of stable equilibrium, and as the load is increased, it gradually deflects more and more until the stress at so some point passes the class elastic limit, when breakdown will take place. Hello, what's up? You think if you are demand it, you can get more of it from me? Okay. It ain't happening. Ain't that soft. I am generous, but I'm not that soft. The load at which breakdown by instability occurs is found by Euler's formula, which will be given and discussed in section 22. It applies with greater accuracy to a long and slender columns, and will be used here in cases where the length ratio, i.e. the ratio between length and radius of duration of the column, uh, L over R, is greater than 175. For solid stanchions of circular section, this corresponds to a ratio, length to diameter, uh, L over D, of about 45. For moderate and smaller values of these ratios, such as occur in the stanchions of warships, columns will generally break down by simple bending before the point of instability is reached, depending always on the deviation from the ideal conditions. The formula can be used for stanchions in warships, must therefore be one for uh, bending under certain assumed conditions of eccentric loading. Now, one of the things I do love about this book is its tables. Yes, it has them. Lots of them. And it's always fun when you have a decent table. Because decent tables can give you material strength, uh, materials used in hull construction. And their various strengths. And assessments. This one gives you the the, uh, the modulus or elasticity used in construction of wrought iron, all classes of steel, compositions, uh, brasses and bro bronzes, white pine, Douglas fir, spruce and ash, yellow pine and oak. It's a fun book. It really is.
Sorry, Commissioner, if the halo process of arterial nitrates have been worked out, how powerful the Brazilian Navy or when would the Guano Wars have occurred? Guano Wars would have occurred probably within about a decade, but honestly, the Brazilian Navy would probably be not much more powerful than it is now. The main reason for this is they might have a few more units, but the main reason for it is actually Brazil's... Uh, how do I put this has had one of those great problems of its history in that it has very bright people, it has a lot of great resources, and it has a lot of things going for it, which means it should be very good. But it does have a habit of suffering from what I would call chronic politicianitis. In that its own politicians, doesn't matter which side of the aisle they come from in their political beliefs, I universally have a habit of mucking anything up. It's very rare that they, the, the Brazilians get competent leaders for long. They either become incompetent, because they become corrupt, or they don't last long. That sounds like a very easy solution. Thank you, IKB4472. Thank you again for delaying these books. Now, Russians. Type of two question. Build a flight deck stern like those of the counties. Do away with the limbo. Put sea dart where Icaro was in real life. Uh, could you put the Icaro on the stern? There's no reason why you can't put Icar on the stern, but you would need to work out a lot of engineering to make it work. But it's not impossible, it's just going to be engineering. It's one of those things. I could could I I could use a book like that if it included balsa wood. I don't think it includes balsa. But there are a few around which might. <sighs> Hello. I do love the way. If I have a certain screen up on that side, occasionally I will get a blue light coming from that side, massive one. And that blue light is YouTube trying to tell me to put in this advert. Seems like the, the sound of pay me more attention. Yes. That is always a sound. In a second I might have to let him go for a wander. As in out the door. In which case, I'll keep an eye on him. But I'll be back very shortly. I will, um, let's see. What slideshow have I got? Oh, I've got those. I will put a slideshow up. Which will, um, just flash on for a couple of seconds. Well, if I have to do so. I That's one of the things I put up as backup, just in case I needed it. Okay, I'll be nice. Right. All right. Sorry, he's asking, so I'll quickly, quickly let him. Won't be a second. Coming, coming, coming. Let me find a shoe. Because you've got a lead on, so I have to come too. The reason you have a lead on is because of what? What have we been doing with squirrels? Trying to climb a cherry tree after them. Yes, I have a poodle who thinks he's a monkey. Come on, you monkey. Come on.
you go, you monkey bush diver. Here you go. Hey, Corolla. <sighs> No, you, I think I deserve a biscuit for that. I was the one who took you out. You think you deserve a biscuit for going out? <sighs> you probably do. And I'm back. Hello, everyone. There you go. Mm, good boy. Right. <sighs> Played interlude music. Potter's built. No. <laughs> I'm a cat that won't let me start garden seeds and not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a bonky. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, let's see. What was the next book? Ooh. Now, these books were all very kindly loaned to me by New IKW 4472, who is very, very knowledgeable in railways. And honestly, if uh, I am tempted at times when we, um, when I look at the railway section, to promote him to something in the in the uh, Discord, because him and Paul love. Uh, Paul, who of course is my one of my admins, one of the flotilla leaders on Discord, does all sorts of things. Paul from Chicago. Uh, it, it, him and Paul both love the railway stuff and the railway stuff on Discord, and it's I enjoy going into the railway stuff and watching it and reading it all. I try and not, I try to not take part in every channel on Discord. I watch them all, but I try to not take part in everyone so that there is space for it to grow organically without me going in there and going boom 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 because I do realise there is a section on there is a sort of reality in any discord so and I learned this from chatting with Drac who basically did explain this to me if there's a section it, 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 the moment you go in as the person who's the dis server owner etc and say things you can even without int intending to inadvertently shut down discussion and if you don't want to it's better to sometimes just watch and get involved when you need to. There are some which I do enjoy. And I do take part in. But there are others which I just enjoy to watch. So. I have the next book stuck up and ready to go. Let's answer some questions. <laughs> what is the loudest? What is on the on one of the loudest sounds you can hear? Poodle eating from a cherry tree. Uh, he's not after eating from the cherry tree. No, no, no. He he he's trying to climb the tree to get to the squirrels. The natural enemy of a poodle is a squirrel. Isn't that right? They're who you must go after. <laughs> as you're being uh, as furry kitten has kindly suggested it. Go on. Very good. In the British jungle, Yorkshire, there are several monkeys, mostly from above the sign. <laughs> oh. There are entire, quite a few passenger stations in the US once had standpipes for rapid topping off of water in tens. A depot in my hometown still has one, just connected, uh, just not connected any longer. That's a sad thing. When it's unconnected, connected, I have to admit, I there is an interesting scenario in the UK in that there are some very very good heritage railways, and that is I have toyed with the idea of doing some videos of going around the heritage railways and going on some visits to them, because I do like heritage railways and I do think some steam train railways would not exa videos would not exactly disappoint my viewership. I, I don't think it would disappoint you all. It's like I've got a whole load of 60 second videos which I'm planning to record over next week so that I have some more regular ones coming out. Mainly Thursdays and Sundays they're going to be. 
Um, but I've got to, I've got the finishing off ones of the um, battle cruisers, etc. to come and do. They are good things. Right. So. Next book. WDLR Companion. Now, the moment a book says it's a companion, you know that there is something which should be brought alongside the main book. Okay? So, companion books, in my experience, often are what I would call chaptery. In that they are very rarely a run-through document. They are more a case of, right then, it, when, when we did the whole book, there were things we couldn't put in, because otherwise it would be massive and it would take you completely off topic. But these are relevant. And so we've written this companion book, so you can go in and see the other stuff, and you can learn more. And there's a lot of you can learn more in this book. War Department Light Railways. Hmm. Western Front. As you can see, nice map of it all. But the point is, this is all the reaction to the issues of logistics. So logistics brought about by mud. This is why I wasn't speaking out of my behind or being facetious when I said earlier that there is a certain nation which would really love some right light railways at this moment. It's because it was dealing with a very similar issue to what you deal with in certain modern terrains where you are fighting. Where there is fighting going on around. And that these light railways would make life very a lot, lot easier for a nation which doesn't have enough in the way of basically trucks which can forward over certain things. And you notice this is one of those trolleys which we're talking about, the petrol powered ones earlier. You can see in the sort of background of this picture. A simplex straighter, the tra a tractor as it's called. Called so because it's simple. There you go. Always fun when those things are put up in tandem towing things along. But they could shift quite a bit of weight for their size. I always love the fact there's the Canadian contribution. Ah. A deck care, petroelectric vehicle. Oh, well, engine. Ooh. Protected type simplex wagon. And honestly, my favourite of the locomotives they used. Mm-hmm. A Baldwin 460. They are some really cute trains. There you go. Really, really cute trains. And I do, I honestly do have a reason why I prefer the 460, but I honestly can't remember at the moment. I think it's just because they're just so cute. On its side. Hello. 
This is a little 060. Nope, there's your simplex. Surname because it's simple. It really is. A favourite target would be to try and take out the engine sheds. If your artillery if artillery could reach the engine sheds, they were very happy. Once they started developing aircraft which could actually drop bombs, these engine sheds became far more dangerous targets for the Allies and far need and be protected far much. What gauge is the what railway gauge is the RR? Uh, this one is sixty centimeters. But RR, I'm not sure what you mean by RR. You have to give me more names than that because there are a few railways which could be RR. What's one is when you sort of go to, yes, how are we going to organise this railway? Let's develop a military command structure. And then let's give them all names which sound like civilian railways. <laughs> it's what it is. But no. It's a very, very cool book. And definitely you buy the pair. Dan Freeman, I... I might take you back to Canada someday. So I'd start to be careful... You know, it, it, you know, it, 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 there are some of the things you say about Canadians. It's, I have to admit, I did reference some of the stuff. Railroad. I was thinking RR meant railroad, but I wasn't quite sure. Because there was also oh, was something that was, could be the Richmond Railway. Uh, Hartlepool in Cleveland, the UK, is the place they hang the monkey, believing it was a French spy, because they could not understand it's jabbering. Honestly, I can see why. Freaking very light and fast light railways. Well, were the destroyers and MTVs a land warfare? Too much firepower, delivery for their effort. They were pretty darn critical to all the logistics. If you don't have them, you don't have logistics on the, in, during the Western Front. It's one of the things that sort of gets either the easily overlooked. I was talking to someone the other day who honestly felt a thought that people in the trenches when they were deployed in the trenches, spent all their time forward in the trenches and they were never withdrawn. And explaining that it was a cycle and that they'd be withdrawn at regular intervals from the front line to different posts and then they sort of, they'd go from the front, the furthest front to the back as far as they could go into a reserve position. And then the reserves would move into the, for, uh, to, the next, to the immediate reserve position and then the immediate reserve would move into the forward position, and they just keep that cycle going. Well, it's an interesting discussion. It didn't always work that way. Occasionally there were issues, yeah, because battalion commands, etc., and structures could break down, but they tried to keep it going that way. They tried very hard. And the railways were key to trying to get food and supplies forward. To keep the people at the front as well fed as you could. It was cold. It was damp. It was absolutely terrible conditions. 
but they tried to give them whatever supplies they could to keep them safe and keep them as properly as well uh, as looked after as possible but often when you see people like going oh they got in an ambulance and they rushed to here they anyway actually more often than not if you were going in an ambulance you'd be rushed to the nearest train station because the train is more likely to get you to the clearing station than the ambulance because of the way the, the nature of the roads especially during a defensive maneuver when you're under attack and there's bombardment going on whereas the trains were automatically going backwards anyways because they're coming forward with ammunition then they're going back empty so they'd be loaded up with the wounded If the British had a working 5.1 inch 50 cal gun in World War II, what how much difference would it make? Um, be, it would depend on the mount. Let's put it this way. The 4.7 inch gun works very well, but they don't have a dual purpose mount for it. The 4.5 inch gun takes time to come in because the dual purpose mount is not available for it. Though the one for the lighter ships. So, if you have a 5.1 inch 50 cal gun, that's great. What mounts it on? Is it on the same one as the 4.7? In which case, it's going to be useful, but honestly, is it any enough of improvement to 4.7 to justify changing the whole fleet? Not in that scenario. Uh, is it on the same as the 4.5? Great. That's useful for your carriers, but is it going to give, does it give you the abilities to do what you need to do with smaller ships? So you need, so it's more the mount that matters than the gun. Can't see, read troop rotation. Blackout of the fourth has a lot to answer for. It didn't add comedic value. Sharing from workshop train from the WDLR books. I have to remember which book it's in. Is it in the? I think it's. In, I haven't got the other one out, but I think it's in the companion one. I think it is in the companion one. Let me see if I can find it. I think it's in this one. Ah, seventy-four workshop train. It is in this one. That was right. Thank you. Uh, before we go there, various styles of sidings and shapings. If you decide you want to build one of these, they're a very cool railway to build. I have a friend who built one. Uh, built, I think he's building one as part of his stuff with the um, a local model railway club. Not me. There are many things I do belong to, but the model railway club is not one of them. Not because it wouldn't be fun to be part of, but because I just don't have the time. They actually, they actually do expect some sort of commitment of time and effort, energy to be a member. And I don't have any spare to give them. Okay, the workshop train. Exactly what it says on the tin. A workshop train. Is it in one to one scale? No, it's in. Uh, he's building it all with narrow end gauge. End gauge narrow rather than an end gauge mainline. Do any of the rubber guns from one survive anywhere? Um, I don't think so. I think World War II took care of those. Could the British have managed the mounts of the 4.5 inch and 5.2 and 5 inch similar size to what the US managed with the 5.38s? 
Probably four and a half inch, not so much the 5.25. 5.25 is a little bit big. A little bit big. Because you have to remember, once you start, uh, yes, it starts out, people go, oh, but it's just a five inch. Well, it's five and a quarter inch. And if you times that by 50, a quarter by 50, that's an extra 12 and a half inches added on to the length of your barrel. Which, in the nicest way, isn't more than a foot, is an extra foot and a bit. Which adds a lot to your movement of your gun and weight of your gun. There's a rubber gun at Aberdeen Proving Ground when I visited about 25 years ago. Hmm. There might be more around than I know about. I haven't seen many, and I haven't seen many notations about them, but there could be more around than I know about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, you have to go back down there. You have to get a pat, because you got disturbed by me moving a book. And... Oh, I'd do it. I'll do it. said is something like, it's the most famous and feared ship. Really? Did you see what the list of things which decided to attack it? What's fun is that there are minefields not far from Iceland and not far from the route of the Bismarck and the Prince Jürgen. If they'd gone a bit south, they could have actually hit them. That would have really changed the Battle of Denmark straight. Fushi. A, that tongue twister is lovely, but B, no. But I will read it out because I'm fairly sure it's a tongue twister challenge. And that's why I've made it a super, ch a super chat. Is it true that Fisher liked fishing and frying fresh fish, never frozen fish, breaded with flour on Fridays at his, friend's ha his friend Fred's house in Frinchley? No. Has there, has there is a there is an eighteen inch uh, railroad howitzer at Fort Nelson? Hmm, cool. Have you around Wilson Williamson tunnels or Birkenhead Central St James? Yes, I've done that line. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I've done actually quite a bit of travelling on the various on the sort of <coughs> metro line in Liverpool Metro. Ah, good old Mersey Rail. I've done West Kirby to New Brighton. I've done oh, all through Birkenhead. Um, even got down to Chester. Uh, and... I think... I think... Hunt's crossed. Uh... 
it's an interesting thing. I have to say, I did find, and this is going to sound terrible, but some things my father said about Mersey Rail, and then my ex-girlfriend, who I was, did a bit of travelling around up there with, said, well, it was very true. There are issues with the line. There are some very good things about that. It's a, ni it's, it's a nice line. It was well maintained, but there are... Um, There are issues, as there is with London Underground, but different issues. Hi, Enoch. Also, if anyone knew where, knows where I can locate a radio control model of Renown a hood, it would be appreciated. Um, I think it's Groutma. Uh, uh, it's Groutma, isn't it? I knew it would come up somewhere when I typed it in. So. Ooh. Bismarck would run in the minefield just trying to make a press. Yes, I think I said that, but yeah, they would have done. But there are... The, the British were very liberal in their, mi in their minefields. For again, I was wondering how you felt about the early underground. I was not electrified, but it was a lot of steam tunnel engineering, including a very severe incline. It's cool. Some of the early stuff on the Metropolitan Line, etc., is really, really cool. And thanks to my sister, mostly, and some contacts with some small students who do uh, d d worked on it, I have been down, and it is lovely. It is very cool down there, and it was very interesting wandering around. There are lots of fun on underground trains. Down here, Drac has a two. Yes, he does. Has a roughly two. Atrus Hermes in his conservatory. Yeah. He's not, not quite sure what to do with it. I keep telling him he should keep, he should just build a pond in the garden and keep it for that. But he says no. Right then. Hmm. Got a couple minutes before next book, so let's see what questions come in. Sir, so Drac has um, had a model of Atrus Kinnisa built by Steam uh, Steam Geezer and Co. He gets some really cool stuff. He gets some really cool stuff. He is... Uh, I have to say, he w earns every bit of the luck he has. And the joy his channel brings him. He earns... Y you have no idea how hard my friend works. Uh, he run That channel is his full time. That is his life. He works so, so hard on it. Putting so much effort in it. There's me who's teaching, writing books, occasionally doing TV work, and doing the channel. I'm sort of split four ways. And even I don't think with all the four thing, all the four ways I'm doing, and the other things I do as well, I don't think I work as hard as he does. I put in a lot of hours, and I do do a lot of uh, work, but I don't think anyone works as hard as Drac does. 
because when he's working he really does pump it uh, really does work very very hard and then I actually don't know if there's a wolf limit topic no it's not uh, there's going to be one soon I think the trouble is I missed the last one I seem to remember because I was away I was supposed to be logging into it I was trying to log into it and it didn't work but there's going to be one soon For some reason, I was not listening on the playlist which while working, and he once stated that a major that was a major UK boiler company went into function in the interval. I forgot company video. Does anyone know which it is? Oh, there's a couple that go to funk. There's Thames Iron Works, and they have boiler construction facilities, but there's a few boiler manufacturers who go to funk in the interwar period, mainly because it's the transitioning to ever higher and higher pressures. And there's one of those interesting things: is people go. Oh, it's not high pressure steam because it's not here. But it's just in a level below it. So it's the highest of the next pressure, of, of regular pressure, to, uh, or ultra high pressure steam versus high pressure steam versus. Yeah. You sit there and go, yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's not as high pressure as what the others are running at, but it's not exactly low pressure either. If he kept it in the pond, we would have, where would he keep the Madonna? Was he... <laughs> very, very cool. Very nice reference. <laughs> I always love a good hello, hello reference. Uh, sorry, I was like, uh, Solid seven years in this channel. Another five years, you'll be right up there when I'm tossing a dart and map for your trips. I wish. I, in the nicest way, don't get me wrong, I would love to be at that stage because I would, in, uh, if I've got books and I'm, I'm doing the channel and I've got TV work done, I would be completely able to get, turn around to... I would be completely independent of the university system. And I love universities. I love teaching. And I would still want to go back in and teach. But it's going to sound strange if I was at that level of that financial security through my own work. I would be basically going, I'll come in and teach. I'll volunteer. Don't mind. I'll come in and do a few hours, do this topic, do that one. See the students, teach them, and leave. And I, if I get paid, great. If I don't get paid, I don't care. Because... I've now calculated that almost for every five days of work I do with universities on contract lecturing pay, I do about a day arguing for me to get paid. Excuse me. <coughs> hmm. That wasn't you this time. Thank you, though, for what we're worrying. Please don't fart again. Hey. Take care, Richards. So, Battleship Bismarck, owner's, uh, owner's manual. Sorry, I forgot to add that the Queen, build of HMS Queen Elizabeth model if a drac is available on YouTube. Cool! I'll have to look it up again. I think I've seen it a while back, but I'll look it up again. Frickin, if you had bought Camel Lairds for £1 at a time, when what would you have done at Slip Yards and Yards? Frigate, subs, or large civvies? Everything. Don't take this the wrong way, but I, uh, the idea... I think a yard dies when you focus in. If you are just building warships, there are now two yards in the UK which are entirely dependent upon, upon the Royal Navy. And Camel Lairds gets projects from them, and Harlan Wolf and all these other yards get projects from the Royal Navy. But there are two yards which are entirely dependent upon the Royal Navy for their living. That's not a good system to have. Yes, and you're not going to get you're not going to get competition between those two yards because what they can build is completely different. It would be inefficient to build the small ships in the smaller yard. It would be 
No, and let's put it this way. It'd be inefficient to build the small ships in the larger yard. It would be impossible to build the larger ships in the small yard. So, we have the battleship Bismarck. Owner's workshop manual. It is a nice manual. But... Ah, uh, the Bismarck story. Okay, let's see. While the armistice of the 11th of November 1918 brought an end to the bloodshed of the First World War, it would be another seven months before the conflict officially came to an end. That happened on 20th June 1919, when representatives of Germany and Allied to powers signed the Treaty of Versailles. They did so five years to the day since the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the catalyst for the global conflict that would claim more than 17 million lives. It had taken six months in negotiations, and then six months to negotiate the treaty. The leading Allied powers had conflicting aims and found it hard to agree on a level of punishment they should make and meet out on Germany. In its final form, the terms were draconian. While crippling war reparations and a loss of German territory in Europe and overseas were bad enough, the treaty also imposed severe restrictions on the size and offensive capability of the German armed forces, particularly the German Navy. According to the terms, the Navy could not exceed six battleships, six light cruisers, 12 cruiser destroyers and 12, and 12 torpedo boats. Even then, armoured ships, the battleships, couldn't displace more than 10,000 long terms. 10,000 long tons. Given that even the oldest and smallest of the German wartime dreadnoughts displaced more than twice that when fully laden, this effectively meant the battleship force of the New Reichsmarine was restricted to a half dozen obsolete pre-dreadnoughts. Consequently, Free Deutschland class and Free Braunschweig class pre dreadnoughts were retained to form the core of the new post-war navy. Four of them were still in service at the outbreak of the Second World War. The Treaty of Versailles was followed by the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, signed by the five wartime allies, Great Britain, the United States, Japan, France and Italy. Its aim was to prevent a post-war arms race and slow these three or five navies to scale back and allow these five navies to scale back the size of their fleets. In the process, they limited the size of their capital ships to 35,000 long tons and specified that the 60-inch gun would be the largest piece of ordnance carried on their warships. While Weimar Germany was excluded from this treaty, the limits imposed by it were adhered to by the larger naval powers when they began building new battleships. The Washington Agreement was modified in 1930 when the London Naval Treaty was ratified by the same five powers. Once again, Weimar Germany was excluded from the talks, but German delegates were invited to the partic in particular to participate in the Geneva Naval Conference, which began two years later in 1932. By then, the Reichsmarine Imperial Navy had overcome strong political opposition to begin building a class of three Panzer Chief armoured ships designed to conform to the restrictions imposed by the Treaty of Versailles. These, of course, are the Deutschland class. Uh, the first of these modern powerful warships, the Deutschland, was launched in May 1931. Mm-hmm. Despite French opposition, this led directly to German inclusion in the Geneva Conference, by which time German naval designers had begun drawing up plans for two more powerful warships, which exceeded the Versailles limitations, armed with nine 11-inch guns apiece. These were destined to become the Scharnhorst and Neisenau. While the British rated them as battle cruisers, the Germans always regarded them as battleships because their armour protection was considerably more substantial than that of any comparable battle cruiser. The British did not always argue, uh, did not argue that they were battle cruisers. This is one of those myths that comes around. It's oh, the British designated them as battle cruisers. Nope. Light battleships, fast battleships. Those were phrases thrown around. Not battle cruisers. 
due to their armor, but also to their style of construction. They are not cruiser build in their form, in the way they are laid out internally. They are battleship laid out. They have a honeycomb structure, not a great big load of spaces. <sighs> These international negotiations and the design of new warships were set against a background of political turmoil in Germany. In 1928, German elections, the Nazi Party, NDSP, won less than 3% of the vote. But their paramilitary supporters became increasingly vocal and violent. The Nazis shared the vote increased significantly in the 1930 elections, and in 1932 they became the largest single party in the German Reichstag. Amid a mood of growing anti-Semitism, attempts to ban the NSVSA, NDSAP's paramilitary supporters came to nothing, and in January 1933, President von Hindenburg appointed the NDSAP leader Adolf Hitler the new German Chancellor. In an attempt to calm the volatile political situation, instead, he let the Nazi ge uh, genie out of the bottle. To be honest, the Nazi genie was already out of the bottle, but was probably also already dying. One of the things about it that's often misunderstood is that they start off, they win an election. Well, they get 3%. Then they do better. Then they do very well. And then they get let, then they do not so well. Basically, the story is that it's kind of convoluted how they eventually get to Bismarck. But the point that's made is that the Germans, and really you always have to remember this when you're looking at the German ship design, the Germans have kind of lost a lot of things. And principally what they've lost in terms of ship design and in terms of their naval infrastructure is the knowledge a lot of the memory disappeared. A lot of the understanding disappeared. It's one of those things, it's kind of strange to remember, but we talk about the people who go off to Netherlands. Yeah, you lose some good designers go off to Netherlands, but also some designers go to... America. Some designers go to... I think Argentina they lost some naval architects to, etc. You lose naval architects all over the world because they can either stay in Germany and build nothing because nothing is being constructed and deal with an economy which is falling flat, or they can take an incredibly marketable skill and go to Japan or America, etc., where they are building ships and build ships because they do have a marketable skill. This is the thing naval architecture is a skill. And people who are good at it are always in demand. Mr. Renner, is there any way to wean those two yards off the Royal Navy, or do you just let them die? The thing is, the raw na the thing is, the way the government set it up, the government can't afford to let them die because then you lose the Royal Navy's ability to produce warships. Those two war yards are the yards which are produced warships for the Royal Navy. But this is where you get into a problem because, okay, so here is where you get into the issue. There is this argument that things are always more ch are more effectively done if you do them in the private sector. But you have to remember, a private sector has to make a profit. Which is fine when there's competition, because the competition, if it works as it's supposed to do on the capital system, will keep the uh, keep the, the profit margins down to an acceptable level. They won't charge more than the, uh, than the consumer and the people who are willing to pay, because someone else will deliver that same service or that same good at a price that they will be prepared to pay, and you will therefore lose out on business. However... When you are running a de facto monopoly for one cu one customer and you are still trying to make a profit, it's suddenly not that efficient because that customer can't go anywhere else because they, in the UK case, case, they have to buy from British companies and from a British yard because we build our ships in the UK. It's a 
po point of political and national pride. So they're locked in. And you have no competition. This is when you start to see the points and I start to argue, going, well, hang on, at this point, you have de facto nationalised those yards anyway because they are they are only solely existing to cater to the government. At which point, how is that going to be more efficient? Because those companies have to pay tax, they have to pay all the things they have to pay, and also get a profit for their shareholders, which is fine. It's what you're supposed to do when you're a private company, is get a profit for your shareholders, all while only charging and the mess profit they can do from the government. The government has no choice about who to go to. They have no other client. It is a monopoly in both ways. It becomes incredibly inefficient. At which point you start to go, well, hang on, maybe it would have been sensible to actually ha keep a navy yard going and have a naval-owned dockyard to build the ships. Because at that point, if that's all those yards are doing, your options are you either make sure you have yards which can, uh, well, you have a couple of yards which can both do the full range of naval production so they can compete, but also do civilian orders and have to do civilian orders as well. And you probably need two or three yards to be able to do this and actually use Navy, uh, Navy get in. Or at a certain point, you have to turn around and go, so, um, yeah. Perhaps it's better if we own the yards and these companies just have a management contract. Instead of us them owning and us buying the stuff, buying the ships from them, we just pay them a flat fee to manage the yards. And we provide the investment capital and we build the what ships we want in them. And they just provide them, they just provide the management of the yards. That could be a more effective route to go than what we currently have. This is something where I get into trouble because people turn around and go, but you were a conservative borough councillor and you were... But I've worked with part all the parties on defence assessments. I don't. I believe it's something which should be above party politics. It should be something properly looked into. And yeah, I was a concerned about our councillor, but that, to me, this is a perfectly sensible idea. And this is when you get into trouble because everyone's sort of wedded to their positions of, of their various ideologies, and no one's thinking about it sensibly. But in this case, I would say it's a logic scenario. You have. A whole thing going on where these companies can only build ships for the Royal Navy de facto because whilst they can in theory get contracts for other nations, those other nations want to build their ships internally as well. And in practice, the Royal Navy max uh, needs to uh, maintain those yards at the capacity it can that they can be expanded should they need them to, but also not so full that they can't they um don't have space if there are issues and again it comes back to almost a case of you you almost want those that company to maybe manage the yards rather than own the yards so that the ships are not being built for profit the yards being managed for profit so the yards efficient but the ship but it's basically the ship has to be built to the standard set sort of thing. It's... There are UK yards building civilian ships. There are lots of the yards you building civilian ships. Camel Airs, for starters. But also there are a couple of... There's another yard in Scotland which is building ferries. There's... Harlan and Wolf built all sorts of things. And a lot of yards build... There are a couple of yards which specialise in the fitting and refitting of rigs, etc. Hello. Not getting enough attention. Hello, Zawiski. Where are the fluffy steam engines? What is the... F what is the full of a fluffy... The fuel of a fluffy steam engine? Honestly, in ju judging by my little one making a whistle down there, biscuits. Or rather, biscuits.
I can't remember. Did you know that when the, they built the Glasgow Underground, they used a lift to get trains in and out, with the current incline only being built during a refit decades later? Yes, I had heard that. And there was also, there are various lines on the London Underground which at certain points had to use lifts as well. Even buying a majority of shares in the yard doesn't necessarily help you with that scenario. Because then you're just a shareholder which they have to make a profit for. And that's the trouble, because in a nicest way, if they are charging you profit as well in a monopoly, and you can't go anywhere else, and they can't sell it to anyone else, they've got to get all their profit from you, which is a bad deal for the taxpayers in that scenario. It's a bad deal. Um, the nut yards in Newcastle, not really. There are some yards on the time that they're not really active anymore. They're not in Newcastle. They're further out, further towards the coast. Okay, nice to go to one. A, you've got that predicated on the fact that Thatcher destroyed UK industries, and one of the things that here's the I know this is a concern of saying this, but one of the factors which is often forgotten is that. The Labour government which preceded Thatcher had closed down more coal uh, more coal mines than Thatcher did, by a healthy margin. Okay? So, yes, she's not great, but she's also not the death knell for UK industry. She has to try and make things more efficient, because it is dying. And UK industry... Uh, how do I put this? There are some very entrenched practices that start to come into play in the 50s and 60s, and you see this in ship design. And my dad used to complain about this in the shipyards. He used to say that Britain had both the most cutting-edge technology in terms of ship design and ship construction available to it, and then you go to the yards, and the yards wouldn't be using it, or maybe only one yard would actually have it, because the other yards, if they tried to implement it, would go on strike. And I can understand why, because they were worried the new technology would lead to job cuts. But ultimately, those new the loss of the lack of the new technology, and there was also the fact that that was the way that management phrased it, which was problematic, and, and stupid. Okay, you should have the new technology should be phrased as, look, this is the way we keep you employed, uh, give people employment for the next 20, 30 years, is by giving new technology, which allows us to compete with the foreign, uh, with the other yards around the world, and this is what we have to do to survive. Uh, but instead, they kept trying to say, eh, this efficiency is going to save us money. They, they, they went to the wrong school of business. They went to the school of business where they were talking about efficiency and profits for shareholders. When if you want to get your workers on side and you have a highly skilled workforce, you need to explain it to them in terms of job security. And that's usually how you keep it on side. Uh, it was very badly run from both sides because the unions didn't didn't have the long didn't exercise. Most the unions didn't. Most unions. Let me explain that. Explain that. Most unions. Some unions did. Didn't exercise long-term views. The government didn't get involved till too late, and the owners of the ship companies weren't any better. Were actually worse than the unions in some ways in some of the shipyards. So it's an absolute nightmare in terms of the shipyards, and the rest of the British industries are not much better. It's uh, it's not a good period. But if we consider if you hadn't had what Margaret Thatcher ends up having to be the government to do, not really wanting to, but having to be the government to do, and she's got many bad points, Thatcher, but she's also got some good points. And one of those is she was, while she stated she was this lady wasn't for turning, she was one of the few prime ministers, in fact, probably the last prime minister we've had, who would actually read the information, read the report, and would come to a conclusion based on the information, not through party ideology. It's one of the real jokes to me that Thatcherite politics today and doing things in the Thatcher way is often more about continuing what decisions she had to make due to evidence rather than the actual thing which Thatcher did, which was read the evidence and make decisions based on the evidence. Thatcher was very much a believer of you read the report and you read the information and then you make a decision based on the information you have, not sticking to an ideological view. Whereas most of the Thatcherite and other 
various factions you have going around the various political parties these days are more about we have to stick to this ideology because otherwise we'll look stupid or we'll lose political support. And yeah, rant over. But it's a, it's it's an issue. There are issues. Hmm. I think I'm just going to uh, we're having good questions so I'm going to put that in for a moment Take care, Shurikun. So I know I'm not signing the American say, but my understanding is a British injury, especially the German, was in difficult times by the late sixties, which predates Fletcher. Yes, it was. It was in a terrible time by the sixties. The seventies were really not that great, and then Fletcher comes in, and I wouldn't. I'd say also Fletcher gets a lot of. This is going to sound terrible, but because I'm going to say something which often upsets people, but um. Thatcher gets a lot of a lot, I would argue, of flack because she's the first female prime minister, and she didn't come from the right side of the aisle. It's going to sound strange, but to I I believe one of the reasons she gets so much flack is because if you talk to and I know people from that generation, there were many leading left wing female politicians who could have been prime minister. And they didn't get there, and it was a case. It was almost a case of, but but they were the ones who fought for these issues. It should be a female from our side who's become the first female prime minister, not a female from that side. But it's it's. I would say yeah, and of course now the Conservative Party has had three female prime ministers. Which really, yeah, let's be honest. Um, good, competent, and oh lord. Um, and Labour Party, of course, has had none. Which. Lib Dems have had a female leader. I, I, <laughs> not getting into that one from Chicago. <sighs> Mr. Ryan, Japan ran into that shares problem. During the 1980s, they printed money to buy company shares so they could have more liquid capital. The companies turned around and gave that money to shareholders. Yep. C. Clark, Alex, but cl to close all industry was equally as stupid. I don't factor because it narrowed the UK economy to an over reliant on the economy. She didn't close all industry. That's the thing. She didn't. It's one of the things which is often marketed as her doing, but actually a lot of it had closed beforehand, and previously the government. But then when she gets involved, she's trying to actually sell off the British government's own industry to sell it into the private hands and try and make it more efficient and get the capital from somewhere because the British government. Because of the way the government had also been running those companies, and it had been a very much uh, consensual politics, is one of the reasons of things we call the post World War Two settlement. Uh, it it really caught it, it had caused issues. It had caused a lot of issues. Uh, in that, Britain was being run to an extent like it was a Scandinavian country without the Scandinavian tax system to support it. And that's not really a, a viable system. If you want to run a Scandinavian-style economy, you need a Scandinavian-style taxation and support system in place to run it. If you don't have one, you can't afford the other. And that is why, of course, she comes out with a very famous line, which is that the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money to spend. And that was because in the UK we had a very peculiar form of socialism, 
we had a form of socialism which was very much a, trying to do a almost non -so, non socialist tax structure and tax system because it wasn't except in the UK it would have caused a, put them to be politically unelectable but at the same time the conservative governments had tried to do various forms of socialism to try and make sure they shored up their uh, their position in the centre and they'd done it badly and again this has to be put by the way please note I would say the fault of the most of the economy and most of the major issues in for Britain in the post-war consensus period has been the Conservatives and the same, in the same period of the 50s and 60s and 70s because the Conservatives had not necessarily been the most sensible when running things. And the Conservatives run the country more often than any of us. The Conservatives get more elected more often. We are, we are more often not have a Conservative MP. We have a tremendous bias towards, stability, towards the Conservative economic approach in the UK political mandate. Governments don't seek what the ancients did, seek what they sought. Mm hmm Went economics philosophy. Hmm. Uh, I I think that uh, anyone who gives her flack because of that, Anuk, i.e. that she was a shopkeeper's daughter, is not really someone I want to engage with in serious political debate. No. It wasn't really, it wasn't that, definitely not that in the nicest way. There were lots of issues going on, but no. Thatcher certainly wasn't that. Thatcher was many, many things, but she was no, definitely no fascist. She was many things, but no fascist. That wasn't her style at all. She didn't like... Fasc uh, the interesting thing about Thatcher, especially considering Thatcherism, is she's probably one of the least ideological prime ministers we've ever had. Yeah, speed. You have to remember with Thatcher, one of the troubles she had was she didn't think she'd be prime minister for long. She thought they would have tried and unseat her, so she tried to go at breakneck speed to get everything done. <laughs> um, I lived through part of the 80s as well. And, yeah. Oh, Labour were really weird when in power. It, honestly, British governments from about... There are a few good British governments, okay? Um, I would say Churchill's... A part of Churchill's first term, pretty good. I would say... Ooh. Uh, let me just check the various prime ministers. Um, I don't have much time for Macdonald, but Attlee is a very decent and very capable politician. I have a lot of respect for Attlee. But basically, you've then got Eden McMillan and Home, who are conservatives, who are interesting. Then Wilson. And Wilson is... Wilson... Wilson would have been a great academic. He was a fairly decent politician, but he would have been a far greater academic and advisor to the government than the guy actually making decisions. 
then Heath, then Wilson again. And Wilson is just fun. And then you have Callahan, and you have a lot of Labour minority governments. And then you have Thatcher's, uh, Thatcher's time. And Thatcher is in power from May 1979 to November 1990. When um, John Major comes to power. And you then have, you then end up with roughly 13 years of Labour government, followed by, yeah, since then we've had Conservative, 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 a Conservative Liberal Democrat for a short, between May and May 2010 and May 2015. And, um, yeah. <sighs> Hang on, Alex, when I made a comment about Margaret Mar Mar Thatcher, be aware that I live for it. I was 1097, so I don't think it's just red, a red left wing commenters and he called me in an industry. I don't think so. I, I don't, I, I didn't think that of you, Steve, at all. Um, I go by, again, my family who live through it, but I also go by sort of the books and the things I've read and the stuff I know from the people who were, because I'm lucky enough to have known people who are around pretty much all the prime ministers I've met them. Uh, of, of, we've had for the last good few prime ministers, I've known people who've worked very close with them on all parties because, again, of the world I work in. So I, I listen to their assessments of them. If I trust those people, I will tr tend to trust their assessment of a person that they've met. And that's where it comes from, my opinion of Thatcher. I think she gets a lot of the... I think one of the troubles for Thatcher is she gets a lot of the blame for what do for finishing off what had already been done. So it had already been done. That industry had already been destroyed by the previous governments. It was being kept going in name only by British taxpayer funding. For some, in some cases. And she basically just goes, oh, there's just no point. There's no point. She survived longer than the, than the Tories or she thought she would. Mm. Mm. I would always say, and the policy I've always taken on politics on this channel, I'm just going to say this, is I have my views. I don't tell people what to vote at all. But I will also be equally rude about everyone, because in my view, the group I, the fact I am what I am, is because they're ones I agree with, I disagree with least and I believe you should be joined up. I I believe you know if you have a view, and you exercise, you should take part and I participate. You shouldn't just heckle from the sidelines. So that's why I do what I do, and I with what I'm with. But that doesn't mean I agree with them 100 percent of the time. In fact, um, they're lucky if I agree with them about 70 percent of the time. And there are some that I agree with some of the other parties. I do straddle and wander around and go on that issue. I agree with them more than you guys. So we need to start thinking about this. But mostly that's because. I am, by inclination, not an ideological pol uh, political person. I'm very much a, I want to seek a pragmatic solution, look at the evidence, make a decision. And I don't care whether the best solution comes from that ideology, that ideology, or that ideology. I don't give a hoot. It's just to put in the best one. And the example I give is when I was a borough councillor, there was a um, meeting going on and um, we were talking about bins and bin pick collection and someone tried to make it into a political ideological debate over bin collection 
And I honestly sat, I honestly sat there and said, no one gives a hoot about whether it's left or right wing. They care if their bins are collected on a weekly basis and the trash is taken away and it's clean. That is what everyone wants. There is no, uh, there is no need to turn this into a political or ideological battle. It's a pragmatic battle. How many lorries do we need? How do we best pay for them? Let's start and uh, the, let's start from there, and we'll, we'll, everything else can be f sorted out in your pamphlets later. There's no term limit for prime minister. Winning Falklands War did help us stay in power. No one ever, sadly enough, no one ever like really likes strong women for some reason. Seeing as someone who's as seeing as someone who's grown up in a family full of them, uh, I I don't really understand it. I I I decided myself it's probably um, in the nicest way. People don't like people who can uh, who they feel can take them on toe to toe. No, I don't think that. The British coal mines were really, by that point, all the decent seams had been exploited to the nth degree. I don't think there are any seams which are really worth reopening. I'm sure if they do, if they, if there is a good option, they will do because they are well studied and they are well, they are well mapped and well surveyed. But um, yeah, I don't think there's any that they're going to go for. I agree, Mega Scrow. Uh, I, I would. Let's see, broadly speaking, um, I'd be called. If you're talking in terms of looking to compartmentalise me, the idea of making decisions based on the evidence, not on any ideology, and not bothering where it came from, is the original foundation of conservatism. The trouble is. It used to be an anti-ideology ideology in that the belief was you shouldn't use ideology to make decisions, you should use facts. Which is probably why conservatives tended to be quite pragmatic and quite good at winning elections. However, modern conservatism doesn't have that or as a bit major group anymore. Modern conservatism has all these different little ideologies in it, which are annoying and, well, frankly, I don't really agree with. So, yeah... The other option I have is forming my own party and calling it the common sense will do what the, do, will do the smart thing, not uh, not the ideological thing party, but I'm not sure what a snappy name I could come up with for it. Yep. Oh, don't worry, before anyone gets too worried about me being too political, I was told that I would never be selected as an MP because um, I don't have an ideology, so they can't predict which way I'd vote or lean in any situation. I decided that meant I couldn't be bought. I don't think people like me are picked anymore. Sadly enough, I wouldn't really stand for it myself, but I did consider it at one point. Mainly from the perspective of, again, if there's no point complaining from the outside, get inside and fix it. There's also a coal stream which is not economical to extract over half a century ago. Maybe quite economical to extract with today's technology. True. True. As said, if the, I think if there are any R seams, they are well mapped and surveyed that are, they'll go for it. Frank Barnett, you list never lean. Mm-hmm. Ah. <sighs> 
Uh, mainly at the time, I was fed up with not being able to get a lecturing post and all these things, and an MP's post is, um, quite well remunerated, re really. Um, yeah. Honestly, I thought I could do some good. I could make the case for proper defence and proper foreign policy. I could argue some common sense positions in the House of Commons, which don't seem to be heard of that often. Uh, I'm fairly good at talking, and... It was quite well, it's quite well paid. And I thought, hmm, I could probably do that. But this was when I was a borough councillor. A long, long time ago. Uh, I lost my seat, I think. Oh, how many years ago? Uh, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I lost my seat in 2019. <laughs> If anyone wants to see a very, very funny photo of me. There you go. A new coal mine is being opened in Cumbria. Oh, that'd be good. I haven't heard much about that, so it must be managed to escape past quite a lot of the press. Don't have to work to remind an extra twenty percent to remind me to pay you as an MP. No, Melanie, you don't. Yes, local councillors, by the way, the big decisions we had to make were mostly over bin collections and planning. And I could never understand how people would try and turn that into politics. I spent half my time arguing for more social housing. Because there is an, in Epsom, New York, the price of housing is absolutely astronomical. And I kept pointing out that if you don't want to pay teachers and nurses an, equal, uh, an equivalent sum, and you can't because they're national pay scales, then we need to make sure there's housing available for them to live in Epsom. Hello! You decided to jump up and say hello. Yes, um, Raleigh has taken over again. Hello, I'm in charge now. Yeah. Hello, hello everyone. <laughs> oh. That's me from years ago as a borough councillor. I just realised. Big spot in my eye is gone. After years. I thought it was there for years. Yeah, Floof turned up. I think he was wanting one of these things. Uh, for this week, Warship Machine Spirit in overall command of every Tron class daring destroyer in their final warloads. Yikes. Are you trying to re ask him has a regenerating bow? That would take over most of the world. You'd need a lot of missiles to take out that lot. <laughs> definitely, definitely too much politics. Oh. We got onto the topic somehow. We got onto the topic of Margaret Thatcher, probably, because that and the Falcons of War. And I have to admit, another thing which sort of um, convinced me on that sort of front is my ex was an absolutely, well, is an absolutely amazing historian. And um, 
one of her specialty topics, as it were, was Margaret Thatcher. One of her real specialty topics. And she knew the history backwards, forwards, sideways. Every way you could imagine. And she's... And it sort of... To an extent, it adapted. It, it sort of added more information to what I already knew. Hey, Michael. Right then. Because I feel like adding another book and talking about it. Let's add in another book. Before we end the stream, we'll, we'll, we'll have a bit more of a stream. A stream. Uh, let's see. 320. Brassies. Hmm. But, okay, I'm trying to find my discussion, but they're opening a coal mine on one side of the country to use it on the other. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense in the UK. No, sir, I'll be getting my own furry assistant soon. That's good. Furry and fluffy assistants are the best. How many basic houses can be built with the price of one Challenger 3 tank turret? Yeah, the trouble is you need both. You need the basic houses and you need the Challenger 3 tank turret. You do. I know there are lots of very cool people going, Ah, the age of the tank is over. But actually, the age of the tank isn't over. It's just that, you know, in the nicest way... The age of the tank as an unsupported solo vehicle has never been the case. There has been no period in history where tanks have gone off wandering off their own and conquered everything. They've always had infantry coming behind them and air support. In World War I, the tanks had infantry coming behind them and air support. In World War II, the tanks had infantry coming behind them and air support. In That's the entire thing of Blitzkrieg. You have air support and you have infantry coming behind you. This, I don't know where this idea has come from, that tanks are supposed to be this, on, on their own, this so massive killer of the battlefield, this supreme thing on the battlefield, when throughout history, they have been a component of your warfighting force, not the warfighting force on its own. It's this, I, I, I do not understand how these narratives get so warped in the national conversation that you get this idea that submarines on their own will data will win a war or a carrier on its own will fight the battle not part of the task group or uh, or tanks should be fighting on their own they're not it's like the idea of an attack gunship going off and being a helicopter on its own buzzing around no you'll always have the attack gunship operating with artillery and with armored vehicles and infantry going forward because that's part of the entire mix the attack gunship launches a sudden attack. Boom. You've got artillery already providing suppressing fire on very on known positions. And then the tanks come through, breaking up position before the infantry follow. And what you don't want to do with a tank and battle, and this has always been the case, is get caught in a narrow column. If you ask what went wrong in the Operation Market Garden, the tanks got caught in a column. If you ask what went wrong at the in the... I don't know, in the Gulf War for the Iraqi tanks, they got caught in a column. If you get tanks, if tanks get caught in a road movement column, they're in trouble. They need to be line abreast, firing away. They do not want to be caught in a line like this with you off to one side lobbing weapons at them because that's never good. Yes, missile tech. Yes, all these things have improved. But that that's, those things should be dealt with by other problems. The whole point of them is, in the nicest way, you should have your own reconnaissance going forward, see them, artillery suppression. Boom, boom, boom. 
That's what they're for. And then you get up to a fortified position. Tanks, blast, infantry, go forward, supported by the tanks, by artillery. That is what it's for. It is not for this solo standing along going, yes, I am a knight charging in a battle. Even knights did not fight solo. We had this idea of the knight going forward as this mighty man. No, they had, in the French, when they're attacking the English longbowmen and the English man-at-arms lined up at Argincourt, they, uh, the knights aren't going forward solo. The crossmen go forward first. There's infantry coming behind them and the tanks and the knights go forward and they're to crack the line. Sorry. Ay. Josh Wright, tanks tend to turn into target practice at the one on the road. Exactly. This idea of fury where a tank goes off and is fighting a solo battle. No! You don't do that. You get killed. You don't. There's, you're not going off for a solo battle. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Kerrigan, you have a bag of open doggy treats. I do not have a bag of open doggy treats. I have an open do uh, I have doggy treats that I can reach into and open. They're twisted up and tied. I moved on to making sea cat missiles. I expect those to be more useful than the real ones. Possibly. Yowza, Stafford. That's expensive. That's why I'm, I consider Britain quite good to be in, Mr. Trendy Zone. There's no worry about health insurance. Furikan, tank is land power projection. They are C-class cruisers of IFVs. Yeah. But I do agree, Sir Andy Zen, that the fact that nuclear, it doesn't get enough positive press for what it does. It's There's a lot of people prepared to tear it down. Not a lot of people prepared to go, well, actually, this is what we need at the moment. I said before, it comes from just the same place, the idea of we just have to kick in the Soviet Union's front door and the whole structure will come falling down that it came from. Ah, yes. Mm. In wargaming, I'm always very heavy on the Air Force. I normally have a plane with a six-inch tank bunker ship buster. It's hilarious. Yeah. I was asking you to think that someone just wants to screw uh, screwed around. The tanks are expensive to buy and maintain, so you just try and devise a reason not to buy them, even if it's completely bonkers. Mm. The England Clark. Ah, Steve. Uh, because on the engine, I have one book, which I acquired by accident in, mix, uh, in a mixed lot of books. Reads Handbook for Examination of Engine Room Artificers. It is my only reference for the assertion. Cool. Hurricane, World War II. So what would you prefer not to go against? Cromwell, Comet, even a Centurion, or 25 pounder guns on a battalion in infantry? Um, it, look, in the nicest way, 25 pound gu guns and a battalion of infantry are not exactly a fun thing for me to try and take on if I'm a tank. I, it depends on the terrain. If they're nice, flat, open terrain, I've caught them sur surrounded and I'm in a platoon of tanks and I've got my own infantry coming behind, yeah, I'll have a go at them, but I'd prefer not to. Because again, those 25 pounder guns are going to be a problem. If I can come up close to them, they can't see me coming, and then I can pop up within short range and machine gun the 25 pounder guns and use my use high explosive on any infantry positions. Yeah, great. But it's a case of it's how's it deployed. It's one of the factors I always have to explain to people is it's not just what you have, because what you have gives you options. It's then how you use what you have. And it's the thing is, it just going, because someone uses something badly doesn't mean you shouldn't have that thing. Because you might not, you, you probably won't use that thing badly. And the whole point about the attack on the, uh, the attack into Ukraine, etc., was... 
nicest way, it was all predicated on the idea that the Ukrainian army was the same Ukrainian army of 2014. And the Ukrainian army had been doing a lot of work to not be still the Ukrainian army of 2014. And they'd had eight years of fighting to turn not into the Ukrainian army of 2014. And that should have been the, the, that should have been the tip off to the Russians, really, that they were still fighting. And you can't predicate your plan. It's kind of like the plan, the plan I was talking about for, and I mean talking about with the German, uh, the German idea, the idea I said of the Germans going around Belgium. Well, one of the bases of that plan is the same idea that that the Kaiser had, that the Kaiser had that the British were not going to invade because not going to fight because of the the various forms of communication, the fact that the Royal Navy hadn't mobilized. So bad communication on the British side lulled the Kaiser into false sense of security, and he goes with the Belgium invasion plan. But that's not the strategically sensible thing to do. That's the very quick thing to do for the glorious victory. That gives you that should give you the glorious victory. But the moment you get the British etc. involved, you end up with a very different war, and you end up with a massive blockade, which is going to slowly destroy and disintegrate the German economy. And that's what it does. Take care, Paul, from Chicago. Hydro is also a good option. But there's limited... Honestly, quite a lot of the places which can provide decent hydro in most developed countries have already been developed. In a, the nicest way, with the rash of dams in the 1920s and 30s and into the 60s. Most of those places have already been developed. Hey, George, you mean? Uh, Megas from nine six inch gun plane. I have assigned to naval patrol and heavy combat air support, replacing corvettes and land artillery. How would I work in 1940s, 60s era Star War? It would get smashed. Because in 1940s, yes, it would be very good, but it's a six inch gun, so it's got to be quite a heavy built aircraft. And if you have decent fighters, you can knock it out of the sky. So it's going to need to have an air defense, and it's going to be even your air group is going to need to have to be a mixture of fighters and attack aircraft. In terms of the 1960s, mm, not a it, it, a six-inch gun doesn't. Considering you're attacking the top of targets, you don't really need a six-inch gun. A 40 millimeter would probably do quite well, fine. And if we consider the thing the warthog carries, etc., that's a 30 millimeter cannon, if I'm not mistaken. You don't near. You're attacking the top, which is the low, the, usually the lightest armor on most armored vehicles. You can, you don't need a six inch, and you can carry far more rounds with a smaller gun. Converse, there's also hydro storage, but even those random places and store and, and the store and feed are back into the, about the same amount of. Um, <laughs> Gigawatt hours of a two gigawatt nuclear plant, a single one. Mm. Gowade is the thirty millimeter. Thought it was. Again, I don't Again, no alarm. <laughs> Apologies. So, what were the arm yachts in the Royal Navy? Uh, they are mostly sloops. But guy, if the treaties didn't happen, do you think the US would have funded an arms race into the UK? Here is my point. The US didn't even fund the ships they were allowed to build under the treaty system for most of the 1920s and 30s because Congress didn't want to give them the money. I highly doubt they'd have funded a naval race. They might have kept building... Let's put it this way. Um, by naval race, I mean a quantitative naval race. A qualitative naval race, they might well have funded. 
So they might have been happy to have a naval race where they're building a couple of ships and or they're building a new standards, which they probably call them the new standards. They'd have built, uh, built the new stand. Uh, it would have been the new standards, and they'd have built a couple of those each, other every other year, etc. While the British are building up their uh, ships, it would have been that sort of scenario, not a naval race like you had with Germany. And this is the trouble: people at the time, to an extent, were using the quantitative naval race and drawing parallels between that and the qualitative one going on between Italy, Japan, the UK, and America. And, yeah. France really wouldn't have been involved. Ian Morrison, do you think it would be sensible to build more Tornes and Batten nuclear plants? I haven't studied a Tornest nuclear plant in that much detail, to be able to say, really. But I do think the Rolls-Royce small factor power nuclear power plants look like a good idea to me. Especially in terms of building up a distributed power network. But I would have to study it more to know about uh, to, to be able to say whether I would want to go build more of that pattern or another pattern on a nuclear power plant. So, 1939 Brassies. Hello, Clipper. Or rather, Consolidated Flying Road. But it does look like the boat. It, uh, it is sort of the, the same genesis which comes to the Clippers. But no, uh, when I was flicking through this, and I was thinking about this today, and... Um, Well, I was considering the various factors in this book and the things that are included in it. And the fact, of course, it has HMS Afridi in it, which I do rather love, uh, compared to the Hans Ludemann. Both completed in uh, 1938. And it has this discussion in it. At this point, the pace grew hotter. Sir John Fisher was at the Admiralty, and his motto was build few and build fast, each one better than the last. He now transformed the armoured cruiser into the battle cruiser, and with the Invincible class tonnage, shot up to 17,200 at a bound. The Invincibles were followed by 1909, in 1909 by New Zealand's. 1,500 tons larger, and then there came an even mightier leap, the sale of 7,000 tons, lions of 26,000 tons, with the Tiger and Queen Mary of 27,000 tons two years later. First class cruisers had quadrupled in size in 20 years. Moreover, the suggestion of the Director of Naval Construction at the beginning of the century had at, at length materialised. First class cruisers were now regarded as capable of taking an important part in the battleship action. Whether or not they were presumed to be incapable, uh, incapable of performing their scouting role does not seem to be, have been very exhaustively considered. It is significant, however, that with the metamorphosis of armoured into battle cruisers, the volume of light cruiser construction sensibly increased. Then came the war, and as a testing time for the claims of the different types of cruisers, it came a, significant, a singularly opportune moment. For the fleets that fought in the War of 1914-18 contained all the different graduations through which the cruiser had been evolving during the previous generation. Light cruisers, armor cruisers, and battle cruisers. Had the war come ten years earlier, the battle cruisers would have been absent. Had it been delayed for ten years, the armor cruisers might have possibly have died out. As it was, the conditions could not have been more favorable for a thoroughgoing trial of the various theories of cruiser construction. What verdict did the practical test of war pronounce on these theories and on different cruiser types which were their visible expression? Let us take the armour cruiser first, for it is about this type that the evidence of the war is least ambiguous. Nothing could be clearer than the unfavourable verdict that is passed on in the armoured cruiser. Very strange. 
But from the very commencement of the war, misfortunes crowd thick upon them. In September 1914 came the sinking of Hogue Cressy and Abaca by submarine. Oh, wow. Old cruisers got sunk by submarine. But they were armoured cruisers. But were they still? would you still consider armoured cruisers uh, when they've been in service and considering the technological and, ma and especially material changes that have taken place between their construction and their the, the, the demise? Two months later, the Good Hope and Monmouth were sunk at Coronel. Uh, yes, by vessels which could outrange and outfight them because one of those cruisers was really not like the other. Uh, a nice way, are we going to blame the fact that you focused on six-inch guns for the Monmouth? Uh, on, on the fact that she's an armoured cruiser? Or the fact that someone had a bright idea that would have worked if it had been used in a war ten years earlier, but didn't work by the time it was in use? In October 1915, the Argyle went ashore and became a total wreck. In December, the Natal blew up at Invergordon. The evidence of Jutland is the same direction. The armoured cruisers were spread ahead of the Grand Fleet, the 1st Cruiser Squadron to starboard and the 2nd Cruiser Squadron to port. To the 1st Squadron, the battle brought disaster and almost total annihilation. Almost before the main fleets had met, the defence had blown up and the warrior had received some grievous wounds that she would could only stagger away to sink the following day. The Black Prince, whose movements during the daylight action are uncountably difficult to trace, ran into the high seas fleet during the night and was sunk uh, with all hands. On the whole squadron, only the Duke of Edinburgh survived. The second cruiser squadron suffered no casualties, but it managed to get so far out of position on deployment that it took no effective part in the action at all, neither in the fighting nor in the reconnaissance work. Eight days later, the armoured cruisers experienced another heavy blow when the Hampshire was sunk with Lord Kitchener on board. Old ships sunk in modern war. That is so surprising. On the German side, the tale of misfortune was equally emphatic. On the outbreak of war, Germany had possessed nine armoured cruisers. By the end of 1915, all but two had been sunk. And moreover, they had been sunk without achieving any marked results. If the God of War had wished to go out of his way to indicate his disapproval of armoured cruisers, he could hardly have done it more pointedly. In turning to the case of the battle cruisers, we should do well to remind ourselves of the functions they are intended to fulfil. They had come into being in response to the theory that fast armoured cruisers, if made more powerful enough, could play an important part in the main battleship action, actually engaging the capital ships of the enemy. In this respect, they must be considered as battleships, and in that capacity are outside the scope of this chapter. As crews, however, they still retain the duty of scouting for the battle fleet and supplying it all information. Though this aspect of their role does not seem uh, to have received much attention from Lord Fisher with his passion for larger and larger guns. How did the battle cruisers fare in their scouting role at Chitland? The answer is they mostly failed. The British battlecruisers were almost wholly occupied in fighting the German battlecruisers, and this duel with their opposite numbers seems to have absorbed their attention so completely as to have rendered them incapable of paying any more than the most fragmentary heed to their reconnaissance duty. I'd say that actually, no, the ships were doing the job, it's just they were failing to communicate it because of BT, but we'll leave that to one side. Um, it was... In the German battlecruisers, for their part, were no more successful. As scouts for the high seas fleet to report the arrival of Grand Fleet battleships, they failed completely. Taken all rounds, the value of battlecruisers as scouting craft in the action was remarkably small. Two squadrons were almost completely occupied with their own struggle. In the judgment, if the judgment of wars on the battle uh, Mars on the battle cruiser was unenthusiastic and was openly hostile to armor cruiser, it was much more friendly towards their small relation. Both in fleet work and in trade operations, the small cruiser showed up as well as the larger one showed up badly. Okay, so why is this interesting? Well, because in 1939, the British government is trying to justify the fact they're not building heavy cruisers. The treaty system has broken down, and they're still building crown. They're building the ta the uh, what I would call the cut price towns, aka the crown colonies, or the war build towns, aka crown colonies. They're building the didos, which are interesting, and they have the tribals. These are all variations upon a light a light cruiser being built. They have no heavy cruisers. They are building fast battleships, but they're not building battle cruisers and they're not really not building that many fast battleships because vanguard is a backup project which is being worked on but they've got the king george v going through and they've got 14 inch guns so various estimates are put out to try and justify this and this is the one they go with now 
the thing is, I would say, if you're going to turn around and honestly tell me that armoured cruisers in World War One are, as a type, terrible, because, you know, none of armoured cruisers just don't work in World War One. I, I would argue, ask you when they're used and what they do, what they when they do what they're supposed to do, because... Armoured cruisers do a lot of good in World War One, and without their numbers, you wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the things. Also, there's the fact that light cruisers are great at doing their job. But honestly, the bow cruiser's main role is to be a fast ship for the fleet, uh, for the, uh, the fleet, not the reconnaissance role. Reconnaissance role is part of their role, but let's be honest, the light cruisers are supposed to be it. And that's more a problem of command and structure going back. This very nicely absolves Beatty of any responsibility. It's not Beatty's fault he's terrible at communicating with with his commanding officer and telling him what's going on and telling Jellico what he needs to know. No, no, it's his ship's fault. Mm hmm. Hampshire was lost by mines, so was audacious. Guess super dreadnoughts are awful too. Yeah, that's the other trouble. When you have mines being laid by submarines and the ships... Are, but, uh, basically, you're saying oh, ships which were so... which unfortunately predated most of the torpedo and mine defences which have been structured into more nuisance ship, recent ships get sunk. It's not the fault of the fact they're armoured cruisers. It's the fact that they're old. How many transfer done? Ah, oh, Sigloin, Alice, the small power plant options, not just using modified submarine reactors. Actually, I'd say they're more closer to modified surface ship reactors in terms of their design. But yeah, they are basically on that sort of form, and they're a good system. They're, uh, they're built on a proven reactor design. They are small modular reactors. They're not small pressurised water reactors. There is a difference, but they are... Yeah. I'd say they're closer to surface ship reactors than submarine reactors. It's worrying the next generation destroyers after the DGX might be hitting 17,500 tons. I think you'll be, I'd be surprised if the DGX doesn't end up hitting somewhere close to that tonnage. Let's be honest, they haven't even started constructing these ships and already their weight has gone up twice. Because they want to put more and more idea, more and more stuff into them. So expect them to grow again. Oh, on, so armor cruisers get killed by large armor cruisers. Surprise. Yes, and then those armored cruisers get killed by battle cruisers. It is a big surprise, the whole Coronel and Falklands thing. It really is surprising, those battles. Make sure I don't know why. Dodos are just really interesting. They are interesting, but they are very small on the cruiser scale. And they don't. The reason the Dido's don't last long in service is because they don't have a lot of space for anything else. They are literally stripped down. In fact, they are everything is focused on building. A, they are a war build cruiser, kind of like the Crown the Colonies are a war build version of the towns. The Dido's are basically how small can we build a thing that has this much firepower?
Comments, Armored Cruise has made a good work in the uh, Adriatic, even though Seren have held the subs. Mm hmm. So, how much of the Royal Navy World War I fleet was obsolete at the start of World War I? I would honestly say if it was built pre dread if it was. I, uh, barring Dreadnought and a couple of others, and even Dreadnought, ha it, it, let, and please, let's note, Dreadnought is relegated from the ground fleet to the channel squad fleet during World War I, because it's no longer up to the standard you need for the fleet line. Arguably, anything built before 1907, or 1907 or earlier, is not really up to the task for World War I. Oh, excuse me, so much iron brew in the background. Where can I find some? You have to remember, those bottles, and there are more bottles down there, are designed for the future thing which I'm supposed to build up in this corner. Um, are collections put together by both me and Drac in FL. So there is, some of those do come from Drac. And they did used to actually occupy the entire top shelf in this room. But I moved them down to one corner. And on the floor in various boxes. Uh, Amazon prices are extortionate. Uh, I'm not sure if their cans ones are better. No, sorry, our small modular reactor is a pressurized water reactor, by the way. It is? I didn't think it was for some reason. But that's fine. They know those very well, but I didn't think it was. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is. A single small Rolls-Royce SMR power station will occupy the footprint of two football pitches and power approximately one million homes. It can support both on-grid electricity and a range of off-grid and clean energy solutions, enabling the combination of the industrial process and the production of clean fuels. They have a whole little video about building an SMR and how you do it. It looks really quite cool. I I wish the government were building one or two just to sort of as a show as a show them. I would say that would be a sensible thing to do with the British with the British nuclear system, to build a couple of those reactors as well. But you know. Who do you mean? Major Atkins? I ask him. He might well do so. Nine six eight three one. So really, invisible glass barrier outdoor and been replaced by new barrier cruisers by nineteen fourteen. Pretty much, 
the Invincible class should have been doing what they did at... In nicest way, the Invincibles should have been in the Mediterranean, or they should have been down the Falklands, or around the world. They should not have been in a primary theatre. They are sort of, by that point, they are secondary theatre assets. In the nicest way, you could have... If you had all three Invincibles sitting in the Mediterranean, waiting for Goban to come around, uh, and uh, waiting for Goban, that would have kept Goban very much dealt with, because as good as Goban is, it couldn't take on three Invincibles. Seems like there are a few sites where reactors which are being done in commission are already gone that could be cited. Yes. Not the infrastructure already there. It takes up a, a, a very small, much smaller amount of space. Doctor, would you say that the smaller the ship is, the fewer upgrades it gets? Well, it's usually the fewer it can get, because you see, when you're dealing with a smaller ship, to deal with the top weight and the mass issues, you have to have to take stuff off before you can add state on. Whereas, when you're on a bigger ship, the first upgrades can usually fit in without any modifications. Because you often have the space left in the construction. For example, the Type 45s, etc. have space in them that they can have the stuff added in. It's only once you're into the later part of life and you're doing later upgrades you have to start doing modifications because you have to take stuff off or add stuff in uh, to add stuff in because the first set of upgrades will just be adding the stuff in and you have the space for it. The later ones in life you would then have to start taking stuff out and doing things or doing options. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, D20 coolant moderator allows natural uranium fuel. If, for whatever reason, it gets out of control, the fuel will melt in such a way it's no longer critical. Which is 400% higher enrichment. Mm -hmm. PWs are quite safe as well. As Three Mile Island proved, idiots literally drained the core in the middle of the May and just said things were okay. Mm hmm. Look, if there if there is one part of modern engineering which still believes in over engineering, it's the nuclear industry. As long as it, and it usually does so because there are standards require uh, require a dome to be over engineered. And it's one of those things which I often I deal with people because they go, well, you know, we want to go for the most efficient solution. I'd look at them and go, there are some things in life where the most efficient solution is not the most efficient solution. If I'm building a ship, going for the uh, war, uh, going for uh, building a a commercial ship, I'll go for the most efficient solution, but I'll add in a bit to give it a bit more strength because I want a bit more strength than I need, just in case circumstances and loads change, because that gives me a safety margin, and that's useful for a ship because if I put it in and some idiot mucks up something, and it goes over what was designed, if there's a safety margin in place then it, I shouldn't lose the ship, and I should be able to stop, find out that the idiot did it and stop them doing it again in future. If I haven't put in that safety margin, I am up, up the creek without a paddle. But if I've got a warship, well, I want to over-engineer that. I want to make that as strong and as secure as I possibly can. Why? Because it's going to be in service for 40, well, let's say 20 to 40 years. The odds are I'm going to want to modify it at some point. So if I can make it stronger and able to take a lot more than it's actually a load since already taking, that's going to make my life easier when it comes to upgrade times. But also, it means I'm be I can't predict with accuracy what the weapon systems it might be facing in 30 years' time. I can't predict what it will be facing in 10 years' time. So if I make it strong enough, uh, uh, as strong as I can do, then I give it the best possible chance of surviving whatever might come after it in that time. 
it's not the most efficient, cost-effective build because it's over-engineered. But it's the most eff it's the most efficient in terms of actually designing what I need to design. I'm sorry, it must be bad luck that the invincible class we use where they should not have been two lions, two tiger, and one Queen Mary would have been better than three invincibles and three no fatwals. Uh In the Fatigals, you can sort of get get away with. In Jutland, but yeah. Honestly, what you're talking about is you should have had... This is going to sound strange, but... There should have been three Invincibles, three Indefatigals, three Lions, three Tigers, three Queen Marys. They should have each been built in groups of three. And then, you know, you sort of go, right then, okay, so I need these nine are now my modern ones. And they're going to go. And as each squadron goes in, they take on the duty of you have three squadrons, nine of them attached to the Grand Fleet for the battle crew, what will eventually become the battle cruiser force. And you have the older ones. Well, they go off and they're in the Mediterranean. Let's say you have the Indefatigals in the Mediterranean going, Hello! Or you have them around the world in pairs. You have uh, you have HMS Australia New Zealand sitting in the uh, in the Pacific going, Hello! Mr... Mr... Hello, sir. He hello, hello, Mr. German... German Squadron. Hello, German China Squadron. Hello, hello, hello. We're here. We'd like to have a meeting with you. And you could have another two sitting in Mediterranean going, Hello, Goban, we hear you're here. We're here as your friendly backups uh, with the cruisers in the Mediterranean. And you'd have another two probably, let's be honest, if you're being, if you're being sensible and sticking around, you've got two in the Far East, you've got two in the Mediterranean, you probably have the other two sitting around either the Mediterranean, uh, either one, you probably have one in the Indian Ocean and one in the um, South Atlantic to fill in the gaps between the pairs. Um, then you have a very different scenario because if you have the same squadron you have at Coronel turn up and they've got even in HMS Invincible with them then imagine what happens at Coronel because well Bon Spey turns up and goes look at all my guns and Invincible just goes yes we can see them bye bye boom 12 inch shells rhyming in. And then they have they can't outrun her. They can't outfight her. What do they have? Their job, their then a scenario becomes they have to try and close to win. And if they have to close, A, they're getting closer for those 12 inch guns. And B, if they have to close, Monmouth with her 6 inch guns is going, come on, come on, get into 6 inch range. Come on, you know you can. Because that time they can actually do the fighting. This is the trouble. The British were trying to win a quantitative naval race while saving money. And they had, as I said, someone who was going, build small numbers, build fast, build often. Keep. Well, yeah, that's great. But you're building two. Build a third and you've got a, you've got a full battle cruiser squadron, squadron. Build a third. Always build in threes. Like with the battleships, you should be building in fours. Well, probably should be building in eights. But we'll leave that to one side. Anyway, I am actually going to say thank you very much, and it's now been four hours, so I will probably start to pack up and go away. I will say thank you very much to everyone for taking part and for being here for the evening. Thank you, Melanie6040, Stafford, Dan, Paul, for, uh, for adminning. Uh, did Sean turn up? I, I thought I saw him earlier. Let me just go back to right by me. And Seneca Nero, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Mega Scrow. Thank you, Frank Barnwell. Thank you, Furry Kitten, Steve Clark. Uh, thank you, New IQB4472 for the books, as well as for being here. Thank you, Steve Richards. Thank you, Orion Taylor. I think I said thank you to Furry Kitten, but I haven't. Thank you. Thank you, Yikas. Uh, thank you, Anuk. Thank you, Ruhon. Thank you, Colin Cameron. Thank you, Tanif. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, Carl Magazine, I think I said thank you, but not sure. Well, so will it. Thank you, Cho Josh White. Thank you, Ian Morrison. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Abzaski. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you, George Newman. Thank you, Thomas Vanderveld. Thank you, Tanif I think I might have said that, might not have. Thank you, Mr. Serenity Sen. I think I have said that, but I'm not 100% sure. So, going to do so again. D -d 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 -d. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, uh, Captain C4. Thank you. Yes, I think I've said thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jack Ray. I knew I was forgetting someone. You're not invisible, Jack Ray. I knew I was forgetting someone, but I, was, I couldn't remember who I was forgetting. Thank you, and thank you for all the memberships, Jack Ray. Thank you, Aunt Sharon. Thank you, Dress Funk. Thank you, John Shea. Uh, thank you, everyone. And hope you have a nice evening. Thank you for watching. And take care. Have fun. Thank you, Fushi. I knew there was someone else I was forgetting. Thank you, everyone. Bye.